Hey everyone, this is your good friend, Dr. David Broden, the Safety Doc, coming to you live from the North Star Recording Studio on an updated system. And I can already see that my camera settings are different. So I don't know if I can fix that right now. Um, but let me try something here. And <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just a second. So this is a test of the emergency. No, it's not the emergency broadcast system. It is the new system. So, all right, good. Oh, I'm hearing a delay. which I shouldn't be hearing off of this microphone. So let me see if I can, uh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, this is, um, I'm running Windows 10. So the computer has been updated. <clears throat> this needs to be um, brought in a little bit more. So um, like, framed out a little bit better, but I don't have access to my camera controls. So, which is something I need to do. I need to put those up on the side. So learning process. So a few things. One is, so I've been offline. This isn't really an official, official uh, show, but um, I've been offline uh, really for about two weeks here, two, three weeks on the main system, because to the right of me is the main uh, PC. And that, um, the beast, the monster, um, was updated. So I had it uh, rebuilt. I had it from Windows 7 to 10. We have a local place that does this, so it's great. Um, and then double the RAM from 32 to 64 gig of RAM. And then also um, I cleaned out a lot of hard drives. I have five hard drives in there, um, one solid state, which runs the system, and then four um, regular um, hard drives. So the computer itself is the PC is very heavy. <laughs> so it's like 50 pounds. And even the, the computer guys like, holy smokes like this. And it's a big metal case. But, um, but yeah, the, apparently the video card in this machine uh, today, uh, sells for $900 and, uh, just the video card. So, so yeah, feeling great. Like the machine is working super. Everything's up to Windows 10. Everything's updated. Uh, most of my stuff carried forward. Uh, very little issues. And then I was doing backups like crazy in case stuff didn't go. But uh, and then we, we we also found that I bought a program about six years ago to make a, a system image, and I never used it. It was it was kind of clunky. So when the guy was working on the computer. So it's only him. He's got a shop downtown here, but he's been doing this for like five plus years. Um, so it's really convenient. Like it's an asset that I have this so close. But he gave me a call and he's like, hey, like, um, do you use this program at all? Which is making like a 1.2 terabyte <laughs> copy of your operating system and other stuff like on your L drive, which is two terabytes. So it's easy. And I'm like, no, I could never figure out what that kind of was. I just thought it was a backup of Windows. He said, yeah, not really. It's like a proprietary software system and your backups exist, but this is an addition to that. And he's like, it looks like it hasn't been accessed since 2017. And I said, just get rid of it. So we freed up 1.2 terabyte. So all my drives are running really lean now. Um, where I have more free space than use space. And um, and now, of course, it's different because it, I'm, I ordered an external hard drive, which is five terabytes. So I'll make a copy of one of my, the, really the drives that I'm worried the most about or the data would be my university stuff, which I also keep up on my Google Drive. And I thin that down too. Um, quite a bit, but I keep my most current university stuff up there in case it's like catastrophic or usually if I'm at the university and I need to, need to access it, then I can just go on. Um, and then of course, photos. Uh, I, I keep two, 
I keep on the main hard drive, all of the family photos since like 2004, since we got a digital camera to present. And then I also burn CDs with all our family photos as JPEGs. And then I have a hard external hard drive in a different area where I have a backup of all the photos. So we'll see. Um, nope, it is doing a little swirly there. I guess it came back. So, um, so anyway, I'm going to use this five terabyte drive and even pull off even more of my university stuff. Um, one of the things I, I had kept was my student classes from like, as long as I had taught, which is 18 years. And, you know, I don't need to, to keep these files anymore. Um, I'll keep them for like the, the last five years of teaching, you know, but if someone is going to contact me and say, Hey, I took your class like 12 years ago and I need this assignment or whatever. So yeah, it's kind of too bad. Then. I mean, but I, I, I have all of these because I do, you know, video lectures that go along with the in-person lectures. And I just have a lot of stuff that, um, I don't need to, to keep, there's really, there's no reason to do it. So I said, um, I'm going to set this, you know, about five years because if someone is going for their degree, usually people taking my classes are going for, um, their administrative degrees in education, you know, five years is what it would take <laughs> at a long, at kind of a long stretch out to to get their degrees but i don't think there's any expectation right as a professor that you would maintain um anything beyond five years so yeah i was finding files of um you know they're all they were all like pdf scans and stuff like that of, of uh stuff people had done 15 years ago in a class that i taught so i'm like i don't need this stuff um so that all electronically just got deleted um so yeah, I freed up, I mean, just terabytes of, of data. But uh, the first, so what you see behind me, obviously is, you know, the, the, I went through and cleaned the entire studio. It took me three days, uh, dusted, scrubbed the floor and just everything going through files. Um, so it's really, really got uh, got a good good cleansing after, you know, it was, it's been a year since uh, the hardwood floor was put in and I didn't do much after that. And then, um, I have my diplomas in the back. Only three of them show my bachelor's and two masters. That was, I had, I've had that for quite a while. I just had it down a different wall. And then after a while, I just put it in the back room because I didn't really have a place for it. And, but because it's already there and it's that one was professionally done, um, I am going to order a frame for my, my PhD, my doctor of philosophy degree at UW Madison. A, a, mat, a Madison frame that kind of matches that. And then um, now that I have my professor of the year, which is over there underneath the big blue moon, um, I'm going to kind of put those all together in a constellation of uh, kind of where the blue moon is right above that area. I'm going to lower so you can see all three of the diplomas. And then um, the UW diploma frame is larger for the PhD. And then underneath that, I'll have my professor of the year. Like none of these will really be, viewable right as you're watching the show but um for the aesthetics of my studio it's a nice background and not that i really have people down here or people visit and, and stop down here but um it is a nice touch and again because i have those done in my phd i literally opened it up tonight i always had the hard mailer that it came in <laughs> and then i'm like i'm pretty sure like it's i still have it and so I'm like, well, I might as well display it. I'm not getting any younger. And um, and now that I have the professor of the year, you know, I think it would be really nice. So I'm going to move the blue moon over to the other side. And so this this also is the last um, last days for the the Yeti mic here. Um, this mic was was throwing up some air codes on the computer when I was running Windows Seven, and uh, I've I've it's been a good mic, but I mean, I've had this thing five, six years and I do think um, it's not as reliable as I think it's been cutting in and out. I think it uh, caused some issues on the system. And uh, so anyway, in short, I'm going to be replacing this with a Rode NT or Rode or whatever you call it. But the, the stand here is a Rode stand. So it'll like work perfectly with a stand. It'll, it'll still be 
a USB mic. I was debating whether to go XLR and kind of go with a soundboard. Um, but, you know, I just, I can't, I don't do enough that would warrant necessarily a sound board. Um, and I think with the Rode um, NT mic, it's going to, it's just to be a better quality, more reliable mic um, for me uh, than this. And I mean, there's all the features on the Yeti mic. So if you have like multiple people and things like that, but I've used that like one time out of what, 180 podcast. And that's when I had uh, uh, Justin Preston Rice down here and we we're talking about drones and stuff like that. So the reality is, I mean, I'm just not going to to need that. And if I absolutely did, I still have my Zoom 4, which I could just set out, uh, which captures awesome audio. Uh, but reality is, yeah, it's time to go to, I think, the Rode mic. And, and the drivers are better, plus I think it's a better sounding mic. Um, so that's exciting. And it'll you know fit seamlessly here on, on the arm. Um, as far as like video, this is still my C910 camera, uh, my Logitech. So this thing is eight, nine years old, still works really well. And that's one of those things where, I, you know, because I don't make them anymore, there's a pretty high demand for those. Um, and it's been reliable, so I'm not going to mess with it. I do have a C920, which I think I could put on this monitor and angle over to me. And I see that StreamYard has the ability now to switch between cameras. So I'm going to work that out a little bit. Um, if not, if the cord's not long enough, I'll just put it over here in the right monitor and kind of shoot over. It'd be better if it was over here because it kind of show the fireplace. But um, and I do have like a USB extender, so I could kind of do that. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to see. I'm going to mess around with that a little bit. But uh, so so the camera still needs to come in. Um, yeah, the five terabyte drive. Uh, and then there are some other things I'm going to do, like uh, I, I think I might run, um, I I might run a drive off of my router because I have the ability to do that, and I'm not. Ex I, I debate it whether to do that or not, um, but I I think I might. Um, so you know, to put like a higher end. Uh, maybe like a hundred gig um, thumb drive into my router. Um, I don't really have all of that figured out yet, but I am kind of contemplating some of that stuff. One of my big my big goals now is to keep going through my Google Drive and my computer and just uh, eliminate files that I don't need. And I was able to get about ten gig off of my Google Drive, which is 100 gig. And, you know, a lot of that is, um, you know, pictures and things that you, that you send so you can, like, do a search. I want any everything under over 15, you know, uh, 15 megabytes that I've sent out. Um, and then, you know, you can find a lot of stuff in email or the people have sent to you. And and then you have the bad thing is you can't just delete the attachment. You have to delete the whole email. But a lot of this stuff, like, you're never going to need it, right? So... Um, and in Gmail, it takes up space in your Google Drive, all of these attachments. So I, I built up a lot of stuff when I was doing the book. So um, I'm going to take all of my book files and move them off line onto uh, reserve drives. And then um, I, I'll keep a little bit online, um, but not nearly what I have because I just don't need to have all of the the build up to both of the books um, kept online. So uh, my goal is to get my Google Drive down, you know, significantly. So, but yeah, it, it's amazing um, to go through. It's been kind of fun too, because I, I discover like photos or little videos that we took of our daughters when they were like two, three years old. And yeah, that's been fun to do that, uh, to kind of discover that, you know, these things were out there, but then you also find like these really crazy, like huge files, like, uh, um, print shot files where I made like a mother's day card for my mom, like 15 years ago. And, and it's like, you know, a 23 megabyte file, you know, things were just really inefficient back then. It's like, I don't need to keep that. So I've been really uh, cleaning house. And then also in my, my pile cabinets and 
part of it comes from a discussion I had with uh, SAST, uh, SAST one too many. Uh, we had a phone call. And yes, this is kind of my green Zelensky shirt right here. But, uh, you know, we, we were talking a couple of weeks ago and, and um, it was about when when somebody dies, right, that close to you, um, what do you do with all of their stuff? I mean, what happens? How does it get passed on and, and things like that? And, and really, like, for me, um, I am the only man here. You know, it's my wife and two daughters. So there are a lot of my things, unless there's probably grandkids, that just really wouldn't be passed on, right? Like all this computer stuff doesn't make sense. I mean, my daughters just have like Chromebooks and things like that. I mean, they wouldn't want any of this stuff. Um, so like realistically, 99% of my stuff would just be gone. I mean, it would just be donated or sold or whatever. And this kind of brings me to a story uh, from this past week. So my my youngest daughter, who's in middle school, was interested or has shown an interest in softball. So we got her a softball glove and you know a couple softballs and a, bit, a softball bat. And uh, so she's been practicing with me and she's very good. Um, so this is something she likes and I think will um, fully be able to do like on a softball team. Um, so that's good. But uh, I brought out my my high school baseball glove, which was a very nice Rawlings glove. Um, I played first base. I had a first baseman's glove, um, but then I also had a regular fielder's glove. I, I don't know what happened to the first baseman's glove, but uh, my fielder's glove was very nice. And um, I always took really good care of it. So I packed it away and I went to, I hadn't used it since high school, right? Since I was done. Um, but uh, my, so I went to get it because I thought, oh, this would be perfect. You know, like I can use it. And uh, the there were two things. One is the glove actually um, was disintegrating like into this fine powder. <laughs> and the other part was the inside kind of was turning to like a tarry substance. And so the glove was leather, but the inside when I, I mean, going back to high school, so this was the 80s, right? It might have been some type of hybrid synthetic or whatever, but so when I pulled my hand out, it was just this black tar, kind of almost like shoe polish. And so I, I tried, I thought, well, maybe the inside of the glove just needs to be conditioned. So I took out and um, I took some um, boot conditioner that I have and I applied it and I uh, was thinking that might resolve it and it didn't. So the first few days I was playing catch with my daughter, I, I was using my glove which stunk and was falling apart. And I used a, a nitrile rubber glove on my hand to keep the, my hand from getting all tarred up and stuff from this, this uh, glove. And then finally, I see him kind of like, uh, oh, there I am. And then finally, um, with, so I, I looked on Craigslist because, you know, I'm like, I don't want to spend a lot of money on a glove. I'll play catch, you know, with her and, you know, throw some pitches and do some fielding. But, like, I'm not playing in a league, so I don't want to spend a lot on a glove. But also, I don't want to I don't want to get just a piece of garbage, right? A Something made of synthetics and, and whatever. So I'm, I'm cruising Craigslist in my area, and I live close to a metro. And there was a guy who, who had a couple baseball uh, gloves for sale. Baseball slash softball. He had three. And uh, he wanted 20 bucks each. And he had the descriptions of the gloves, like the model numbers and like said, excellent condition and you know, well cared for. So um, about an hour away from me and I needed to get my dry cleaning done in his close to where he lives, like 10 minutes away. So that's another story. Like our dry cleaner closed down in town after 70 years. And all the area dry cleaners, which were part of this dry cleaning company, they closed down because of COVID and people just aren't going to accept dry clean anymore. And I have a Navy pea coat, Navy, right? Um, you know, which is awesome quality, heavy wool, um, directly U.S. Navy. 
and uh, my sport coats and my sport coats I wear when I teach at the university. And of course, you know, my Navy pea coat I wear all through winter. And I get so many compliments on that. It's just, it's a Navy issue pea coat that, you know, is probably now 25 years old, 30 years old, uh, but kind of like new. And that was, a, I was also wearing it when I total up my car. So it has this kind of protective feature to it, but uh, in excellent condition. I mean, just showing a little bit of wear, but that needs to be dry cleaned. So um, I drove that and I took 10, all of my sport coats, all 10 sport coats down. And it was actually pretty reasonable um, to this mom and pop family dry cleaning place about an hour away in a smaller community. And they've been there again since like 1950. And, and uh, they, I took it down Monday and I picked it up today, all my dry cleaning. So I'm thankful for that. And I didn't want to, I, I could have gone a little more local, like to the metro area, but then I'm kind of like, you know, this mom and pop, they've been in business and, you know, I call them up and um, I want to support them. Plus also, I think then you're not just a number. I mean, maybe I'm naive in that, but, um, but anyway, so, um, but anyway, this, this guy lived close to the, the dry cleaners. And he said, Hey, I'll meet you over like a couple blocks from there. There was a restaurant and, uh, and I will bring the, the gloves. And, uh, so anyway, that was, that was on Monday. And so he, he shows up and nice guy. So, but here's a story. So he was saying, you know, I was in a men's 50 and older softball league. So I played softball and you know, I use these gloves and then COVID happened and, you know, the, softball leagues were shut down and then um you know now they're starting things back up but i have cancer and they are you know being treated and things are going okay but i can't play anymore so I'm, i've been like cleaning out and kind of downsizing just a lot of things and whatever and like the gloves were just part of that and and so we had a good talk we talked for like 30 minutes and he was genuinely um you, know, you could tell he cared for the gloves because again i mean god who knows like I can't look, I, I never could look at a glove, any glove I own and said, oh, this is a Rawlings model AB, you know, 1250 or something like that. And the guy knew all of that stuff. So, I mean, he had definitely taken care of these gloves. They're very nice gloves. So I got three gloves, total, all leather, really nice, excellent condition, you know, from probably, he probably had these in the mid eighties. And I think he like probably redid the webbing on them a couple of times, um, but they were in great condition. Uh, 60, $60 for three leather gloves, which I thought was a great deal. And of course they're all broke in. And so I have one. And then my, my daughter, we already got her a glove, but kind of like a starter glove, like a Walmart starter glove. And then like from the other two, I, or basically any of the three, I mean, I guess I would use any of the gloves, but I, I told her, I said, just, are there any here that you like? And there was one that she liked. So that would be like the gloves she would go into. But then, you know, as a family, if we're going to play catch or she's going to play catch with friends now, we have a couple extra gloves. Um, so I thought that was really great because I'm going online. I'm like, oh, here's like a new glove for $160. Well, that's crazy. I'm not going to pay $160 for a glove. Again, I'm not playing in a league. But, uh, but yeah, they've been working great. I've uh, been using them and we've been having a good time. So, um but yeah, and because I had to go there anyway, it wasn't like really a ex gas expense because I had to go there for my dry cleaning, which I believe is tax deductible because the miles there, uh, because I wear this for my university work. So I'll have to mark that down. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of weird because I there was there's a place, there's a guy, I don't know if it's a guy, but there's, there's a place that has old fire engines out in the yard and they must have been there. I took pictures of this maybe like 10 years ago because I had some meetings down in that area. Now my way home, like through the country roads, around a corner, there was this, this place that had this farm place that has old fire engines, like maybe 1930s ladder trucks and a couple pumpers like in his yard. And then one was like in a shed, but you could see them from the road. And I stopped and I got out of my car and took a couple photos. And I have those. I found those actually as I was going through my, um, as I was going through things, but, and I, I thought I could find it again, but I can't. And then the Garmin, you know, was trying to take me in all these crazy places and I don't drive that enough to really, 
I couldn't retrace my steps. So I didn't, I, I was looking forward to seeing the fire trucks again and I didn't, I couldn't find them, but, uh, but it was a nice drive because I did, you know, you, I can take the interstate and get down there faster, but um, by taking kind of these country, not really country roads, but kind of like secondary roads, it, it was just a nice drive. Um, you know, 70 degrees, partly sunny or sunny, and you can have a window roll down and, um, yeah, it, it was just, it was a nice drive. I don't put a lot of miles on my car either. So once in a while to get out for a 60 mile drive is a good thing for the vehicle. Run, run some gas through and, and, uh, cause, cause I mean, literally I put on like five, 6,000 miles a year on my vehicle. So, um, this was, this was a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, that was good. So anyway, um, so, so yeah, it was kind of weird because, you know, when I, when I got the gloves from the guy, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, right. The, the reason he didn't play anymore because, you know, he had cancer and, uh, and so it was this, this kind of weird passage of the, the gloves. So, hey, it's Robert Ribbit Harrison. Hey, I'm running straight off of, uh, YouTube tonight, kind of testing out. I updated, I got the computer back today. Uh, my PC. So, hey, Robert, I, I, I'm not running StreamYard, so I, I don't know how to like highlight the comments and stuff. But um, so, so yeah. Um, so I do have the glove. And actually, my, and my daughter, my middle school daughter and I went out and flew her kite on, I don't know if it was Sunday, I think. Uh, so it was maybe like 60 degrees and partly sunny very windy, but it didn't feel cold because it was like a southerly wind. Um, and so there's a, there's a field, an elevated field near our hospital, which is on our, our side of town where we live. It's kind of newer development. Hey, it's all pro limited. Hey buddy. And, um, and we got her this kite like four or five years ago for Christmas. So it's a very nice kite. And she was, um, so back then she was really into it, right? Because they used to hold a kite, like these you know, professional kite flyers with these massive, like probably multi-thousand dollar, you know, 50 foot kites used to come in. And right there at that point where we were flying, used to do these sh kind of shows or these entire days. And then the kids would come in and kids, they would make smaller kites and, and they don't do that anymore, you know? But um, so when we first moved here, so she remembered that. But uh, so we bought her a really nice kite like five years ago and she flew it quite a bit. And last year we had it out a couple of times and then, you know, yeah, and I said, hey, you know, you're getting older. You're not going to do this much longer. Um, so let's go up there. And, and so I have a, I took a 30 second video and I took some photos, but uh, it was perfect wind the entire time, which was about 45 minutes. We were up there flying the kite. So it has 100 feet of string, 100 or it might have 300 feet of string. It might have 300 feet. I mean, because it gets really, really big. It's a really nice kite. Um, she, uh, it only crashed once. So that was perfect. Um, and and this, all of the, the field stuff hasn't grown up yet because in three, four weeks, it'll be more difficult to do this, right? Crashes. And I'd have to go out and through like, you know, thicket to get this kite. But uh, But she had a good time. You know, we got some pictures and it's one of those things where I think it's important for kids to have those experiences that aren't um, what like digital and things like that. Right. It's just it's out there flying a kite and that she had done that. And and I don't expect that she's going to be interested in flying a kite, you know, much longer. You know, maybe she'll do it a year from now. But uh, but it was good. So Robert is saying looking good, clear picture, sound. Hey, well, thanks. I'm actually going to change out this mic with a Rode um, NT USB mic, which I think will be better. Um, this mic has, has um, was throwing up some air codes in my system. And I don't think that's uncommon. I was doing a few searches on it. So um, it served me well. And it, it does actually have some settings that the Rode one won't have. Like I could turn it to wide, like if I had a lot of people in here, but like I've done 180 episodes, it's done it's five years. I've only had to use that feature one time. Um, so yeah, thanks. This camera has been awesome. So I'm not changing the camera. It's an older, it's a 910 US, um, 910 Logitech USB. 
and uh, and to me, it's much better than the 920. I have the 920, and I went back to this one. Um, so I don't really think like this would this would wear out. But I'm going to move the 920. I'm going to put that in here just because I I do have it. I've had it for a while as kind of my backup. Um, so this is running off my PC right now. Um, so what you see, this isn't framed in as well as it would be if I was running my regular StreamYard. Um, it has a little more extra on the outsides, but I do have my, I have three of my diplomas <laughs> in the back. You can kind of see a uh, bachelor's, two masters, and I'm going to order a frame for my PhD specifically from UW Madison. Um, and then I have my professor of the year award. I'm going to reconfigure things and kind of put those in a constellation back there. And I might be getting the SI Hayakawa, uh, prize, the award, and hopefully the plaque for my, uh, book that will be determined in fall. That's an international award, but my book philosophy of information made it into the nomination. So there's like a process to filter into that. And I've made it, if that does happen, that would be really cool. Um, and that award would go up, I think there, or else on my right-hand wall is all of my kind of book stuff, like my big images I had of the book covers and stuff. Maybe it will go over there, but it doesn't really fit over there. I've got the kind of um, pretty occupied. So I don't know exactly where I would, if I get a plaque or how that would work, but um, Robert's saying, that's awesome. My three-year-old, daughter got her Easter kite caught in a local tree. We were going to open up a new one for her tomorrow. Hope other winning. Nothing's fancy. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. So um, that's very cool. Yeah, I'm glad we did the, I mean, it was a Christmas gift and I don't know. I don't remember how much it cost. I mean, it wasn't like super expensive, but I mean, it was a nicer kite, you know, five years ago. It's held up pretty well. I mean, it's frayed a little bit, but that's what kites are supposed to do when you use them. Mm -hmm. Um so that's been really, it, it's a cool thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad she's had that experience and I'm glad, you know, we have some photos and some video. And one of the things I found when I was going through my, my hard drives, right? I got five hard drives and, um, on this desktop as I was backing things up as I found a, a video we took of my, um, my middle schooler, but it was when she was uh, like, um, almost three years old. And she was that had her little tricycle, and in the background is her bike. We bought her um, a small bike, and we had training wheels on it. And um, so she was going to start using her bike. You know those little kind of small, the small wheels and the tight. So um, she had won it. You know a, a bike, and so yeah, she was like two years, eleven months, and we have her zipping around the driveway with her. Um, trike and it was like the the last day she was using her trike because her new big bike for right was in the background and it was just fun to see that uh how fast she would zip up and down the the driveway in that on her trike and kind of you know like i didn't know that i don't remember that we had taken that that video i wish we would have taken more videos of the kids doing things like short videos like 30 seconds a minute video I, th I guess that would be my suggestion to anybody here you know if you've got kids um especially like really really young kids is to you know try to to do like those 30 to 60 second videos um you know nothing that you have to get in there and to do editing on or anything like it's going to be you know long and stuff like that but um because those I found a few of those and they were really cool. Like we had one when we were out on vacation and then, you know, I think um, it's kind of weird because when we were at Disney, I never, I, we had a lot of photos taken, but I never took any video, um, which is kind of weird. So I, but it's kind of, it's, but then we kind of think back, right? Like people, um, you know, 50 years ago, I mean, people weren't taking video or, you know, if you had a camera because you had a, you know, film was expensive and to develop and stuff like that. I mean, on a whole vacation, you know, maybe you're, you're measuring out your 24 photos that you're going to take. And I burned. So from November until now, this week, I burned all of the photos that I took because our phone, my phone now is basically, you know, the camera, right? Um, I don't have a separate standalone shooting point camera. I just use the phone. Um, I had 1,300 photos that I took. Uh, most of that, you know, just like just family stuff, Easter, Christmas, stuff like that. And um, and I burned all of those to 
CDs. I burned 10 CDs and I burned them to my external drive and moved them over to my internal. And then I cleared off. I, I have it so when it takes a picture on my phone, it automatically up, uploads it to Dropbox. And then also it's on the phone. So I cleared out the phone to free up some memory. And then I cleared out my Dropbox to clear, have a bunch of memory freed up. But it's a good plan. Like, you know, Dropbox will give you, I, did, I, th I think I have 10 gigabyte for free. I don't know how I got that, but, um, you know, because if you lost your phone, right, you still have all of the photos that you took would it be uploaded to Dropbox. You still be able to up, go out there and get them. Um, so that's, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, but yeah, I, I cleared out and I cleared out um, all, uh, previous safety doc podcasts. I did delete them. I just moved them all over to external hard drives. And I found actually the first one, but it was only in, I only found the audio. I don't know what he did for, for video, but I think like the first five are kind of sketchy. Uh, they're not really well documented and then it, they're kind of out there, but um, I put all my um, podcast out on an external drive and I don't need all of the um, feeder stuff that goes into that, right? Like all the graphics and things that I use because I'm never going to reproduce those podcasts and they're all out there on, you know, YouTube, and if they're not on YouTube, then I obviously just have the final version rendered on my drive. And I mean, it's not like I really need all the stuff that goes into those. Um, so I, I don't need to be saving, um, you know, <laughs> tw uh, two, two terabyte of uh, raw rendered video or waves. Hey, Chris is not here. Hey, Chris, good evening. Good evening to you, buddy. Um, so yeah, I've been going through and, and, uh, and doing that. So, um, so I've been, so I, I am really happy with the upgrade to windows 10 and the upgrade from 32 gigabyte of Ram to 64. Um, it's made a big difference, uh, to go. I, I first rendering, I rendered some, uh, video, uh, just a few things that I wanted to kind of get put together, not stuff that's on YouTube, but, um, and the machine was significantly faster. Having multiple browsers open with 64 gig of RAM is so much better. Windows 10 just seems so much more stable than what 7 was. Because literally, I was running 7 until a week ago. Um, and then, I again, I have my three monitors. And I'm contemplating, I now, my video card is enough uh, to run five monitors. And with the RAM, I'd be set. I'm contemplating... Um, on my right to stack monitors. It's a little bit tricky. I don't know exactly how it would, it would work. Um, there's a monitor stand that I've been eyeing made by Vivo or something like that. It's pretty good reviews. Um, and with a VESA mount, but I can get a nice um, monitor from our computer guy who rebuilt all this um, for 80 bucks, like a nice used Dell that I can either use horizontal or, portrait um and all my other monitors are dealt the the reason i'm considering a fourth monitor frankly is i want a monitor where i can just park a youtube video or a movie right um on a dvd i've got a lot of dvds i throw over here on my dvd drive and um and just i like to have that going when i'm doing other things and you might say well you have three monitors yeah now when i when I do like university work, I usually have the, my university class up on one. I have whatever I'm doing on the main monitor and then somebody's rendering or whatever. It's on the right-hand monitor. So I already use all of my three on my monitors. And I like to have, um, so what I'll do is I'll open up a YouTube video, right? A podcaster's thing and I'll have it playing in the background. Um, but I would prefer to have a monitor. Now, if I put it over here, the left is a, maybe a little bit bigger, but then it messes up. I don't really, I have a, like a light that comes over here. It kind of messes up. The only problem with here is it blocks my view of the stairwell. Now, granted, like a lot of people aren't coming downstairs outside of my family, but um, I'm not sure. But it, I could put a monitor up on my right-hand side I have a, a table there and I could modify like this, this bracket online and, and whatever to, to have a monitor that would be higher. And then I could have stuff playing up there. And I think that would be nice. I, I think it would be a good, a good addition to the studio. 
um, to have kind of like a, just, and, and other people will be like, well, why don't you just put a TV down there? Well, yeah, I could do it over uh, maybe the wall in front of me or the wall on the left, but then I don't want to be, I'm not going to be watching TV. And first of all, I don't really watch TV and I don't like commercials and, you know, we have cable and there's a Jack just over here, but I, I don't want to do that. Like, um, you know, I, so in that sense, yeah, I mean, I guess I could throw up a, but then I have to be watching over here and this really isn't the purpose of the office isn't to watch TV. <laughs> so I just think to have a monitor over here that, uh, I could throw YouTube videos up and DVDs and things would be kind of nice because it's more of a distraction. When I was in college, um, Hey, gotta go, gotta show, gotta say, Hey, thank you. Swamp dog. Appreciate it, buddy. Big time. Hey there. Um, so I'm talking armory. I did my intermission. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've been, I, cause when I was in college, I did, I record it. So we're talking like nineties, right? Like probably early nineties. I would record movies like revenge of the nerds and things like that on cassette. So I would just like leave it playing in front of the TV and then, I had all these cassettes. This is really before like computer, you know, it's floppy disk type stuff. Um, but yeah, you're going to a convention, Swamp Talk. Good for you, buddy. And uh, I, as I would study, I would listen to this. It was always background. And you never had the poll of, of video because it wasn't an option, just audio. But it, I felt um, it was really a good thing for me to like help study and stuff like that. And now when I do stuff down here and work on different projects and stuff like that, I really like having a monitor that just is playing either a YouTube video um, or it's playing a DVD of like Fletch, Fletch Lives or Back to the Future or something or Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, whatever. Um, and it's just playing, right? You know, it's just, it's, it's just up there. Um, uh, and then also if there's anything kind of going on, like weather related, I can like throw up and have like, you know, the, the weather radar up there and stuff like, so, so I'm kind of, I'm really close. To, the only thing is the bracket, like, um, and if I don't have a good, if this, these brackets are kind of sketchy, right? It's like, I, I, I know a couple of people in town who could wall it up a little bit stronger for me if it needs to be, I don't, I don't need a monitor like crashing over. Um, so anyway, I think I am going to do the, the fourth monitor. So can't go too long. Monday convention and Eric is it so swamp. Is that, is that a trip for you? Cause I don't think that's near you. Right. So I'm talking going to Houston. So ske yeah, sketchy brackets. I don't know. I think it, I think it's going to be okay. It's just, if it's not welded very well, like, most of the reviews say, oh, there's a strong bracket and things, but then there's a few reviews saying, oh, like broke at the weld. Um, I need to immediately like assess it and then take it to somebody I know, right? And say, I just weld this up strong. <laughs> I don't care if it aesthetically, I'm never going to see this anyway. It's going to be mounted in back on a table, but, um, but you know, it has the arm and everything with the vest mount. So it's like, you can't just tell someone to make something like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, because the PC is over to my, my right to actually wire it and hook it all together would be a piece of cake. It'd be super easy. And the one thing about when I had this office change up last year is the desk has about 14 inches of space in back of it. So I can actually take out my file cabinets over here, just roll them out and walk them back to the desk. And so I can get back there to maneuver cords and stuff like that without much hassle, which was a smart thing. I actually should have moved this out just a maybe two inches more, but, um, so yeah, I, I think I need to, I just need to go ahead and to do that. I mean, if it all, if it doesn't work, it's not that big of an investment. Um, cause the monitor is like $75 used. Um, and, and then, yeah. My three monitors are all two years old in, in front of me. I might be three years old. I think I got these uh, in November of 2019. Yeah, I did all three of them. So they're all fine. Um, but I think, anyway, so long day. Well, take care, you know, Swamp, uh, buddy. 
Hey, if you're looking for hey, six hours, my uh, my audio book is six hours and 40 minutes. Is it just you or are you going down there with uh, other people? If it's just you, um, I can share the audio book as one continuous file out with you as a reviewer. And if you want, you can listen to it. It's, it's seriously just one file. <laughs> so you start, it'd be six hours and 40 minutes um, velocity of information. So Swamp, let me know if it's just you and you're not going to be jamming out to Metallica or anything like that. Um, I can share that with you tonight. Uh, so, just, oh, I don't know. So I don't know if your wife would be into listening. Now, it's professionally narrated um, by an actor. I can't identify who it is until it officially releases. It's distributed on April 1st of 2023. But um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if your wife would be into listening to the philosophy of information. So you'll have to let me know. Send me an email. Um, but um, so, so yeah, I'm going to, to kind of spruce up the back a little bit. I'm not going to do any, I'm keeping the, I don't know, ply, not plywood, but the wood, right? <laughs> paneling. I'm keeping the wood paneling, which, I'll tell you what, Swamp, yeah, I'll, I'll, let me do this. Um, this is pretty cool here, like having, yeah, Windows 10. So Swamp, hang on here. Um, I'm going to try something. Uh, hang on. Nobody leave. Do a thumbs up. I'm, I'm up to like 1,190 subscribers right now. So, yeah, Ryan Reynolds. So it's a, yeah, it's weird because it's April 1 of 2023 by contract. Um, it gets distributed then, but I own the rights to the audio book. So actually I own the copyright to my book, but the publisher, I can't distribute print copies, but I do own all rights to the audio book. And it's already done. It's kind of weird. So it's done, but it won't be released. Um, School of Airs is also done in audio book, but um, my... Uh, where I had the studio where I recorded it, um, they their stuff crashed. They had all so the, all the files are there, but their programs to render, they they've decided to upgrade. Um, so they it's I don't know. It's basically, it means it'll be July fifteenth, and the audiobook will be out of uh, School of Airs. Well, um, so right now, right, which is getting more attention um, because of the events of. Uh, the last uh, couple days here. So, um, but let me, let me go in swamp. Here we go. All right. Let me see if this works. There's definitely a, definitely a slim chance, but no, we should. Um, so I'm kind of adapting to the, uh, to the speed here of, uh, here we go. Hang in there. Swamp, hang in there. Uh, the new system is just so fast. Like, um, but I'm, I'm adapting to it. So, um, Swamp Dog. There we go. Okay. Um, just a second. After you have a look at this. I can't keep it as in All right. So Swamp, check your um Check your email. What? Oh, just wait. Don't check your email. Sorry. Um, I typed your email wrong. Hang in there, buddy. Um, Jeez. All right. There we go. Okay, buddy, right now. Um, go over and check your email. So 
Swap, check your email. So follow the directions in the email. Um, anyway, so yeah, um, I'm excited to get School of Airs out there. That'll be released in paperback this summer. It's been out there in hard copy ebook, but of course, you know, a lot of people right now are wanting that genre of book. And then I think to have it out there in audio is going to be very, very helpful. So, um, but yeah, velocity of information is all ready to go. Just, it's a weird thing. Can't be out till April 1st. And then, um, something else. Um, what is it here? Get the files up. So let me check. Andrew, no sport code set. So I did, um, yeah, this isn't an official official, but I did re retrieve all of my sport coats today. All 10 came back from the dry cleaner. So, um, there will, the official show, which will count as show one, 182 will have a sport coat and I'll be dressed all nice, but, um, uh, I'll let you know. Oh, you're at a hotel. Okay. Well, all right. Well, hang with it because it is, it is like 550 mega megabytes, which isn't too bad. It'll take a little bit of time, but it's not like downloading a movie or anything. Um, but yeah, no, all my sport codes are clean. So you will uh, see doc and the spark code and everything. So, um, uh, I'll prolong on doc. What was it like being on the critical instance briefing team? Looks interesting. So, Hey, did you find, you found that on my webpage that was, um, and I have amazing, um, uh, kind of stories from that. Like not some, I can't share, but, uh, let, let me, I'll let it download tomorrow night. Download it now, man. It's not that big of a file. Jeez. Come on. All right, Marasnia, but it'll download. Um, so all pro Lowentiment is asking, what was it like being on the critical instant briefing team? So that's on safetyphd.com, where it's all about the doc. I assume that's where you got it. But uh, so I was, um, this was maybe from 2000, I don't know, 13, 14 to about a year ago. Um, and uh, I I was asked by um, not a priest but kind of like a pastor who worked with the uh, police department and fire department um, on debriefing and uh, and so hey it's asked one too many it's it's asked one too many it's asked um, one twenty five kilobytes come on swamp. You got to hook into the Wi-Fi over there at Taco Town or Burger King or pull up to a nearby Arby's and uh, get that thing downloaded. Leave it leave it on overnight. It'll download. Um, let me know after it's been downloaded, though. Uh, so, yeah, I was a critical, critical instant debriefer, um, which meant that I would be called. There was a, a pool of us, right? And, um, and most of these were were counselors or, or, you know, priest pastors. And we would be called and then meet with first responders, fire police, um, after a, a pretty significant, uh, event that they responded to, um, like a, a drowning or multi-vehicle fatality accident on the interstate, which goes by us. Um, so, then I, I went through training. I think it was four days long, and it was paid for by the county. I, I don't know. I mean, this was a while ago. Um, and in that, tr the training was very intense, um, extremely intense. And I remember it, it was um, it, it was very well done. But I remember one one of the guys who was doing the training. Um, and he was local. I mean, it was like 20 miles from where I lived. And he was telling this, this story, right? And he didn't realize what was happening until the end of the story. But he was telling the story and he said, you know, I was on an ambulance crew and I got a call 
to, uh, it was at night to, you know, there was a car flipped over, right? So I arrived with, you know, whoever's in the ambulance, you know, with him and, you know, you get out of the vehicle and I start to walk toward this car, which is upside down. And as I'm walking toward it, um, so he's telling this, again, it's like 20, maybe 15, as I'm walking toward, there are police walking toward me. And he said, because it's, you know, I, I was doing this for a number of years. Guy was probably only in his early thirties, but he said, you know, I knew these officers and they're walking toward me. And one of them, um, you know, grabbed me by the elbow and turned me around. And he started to walk me back to the ambulance. And I said, well, what are you doing? Like, I got to get over there. And he looked at him and he said, um, that is your wife's car. She's underneath and she's dead. And, and amazing, right? I mean, he, he goes back to the, uh, you know, vehicle, the you know, EMS and, and uh, you know, they put him in a squad car and they took him back to the EMS dispatch. I don't, I don't remember this like exactly. And, uh, and everybody was waiting for him there. You know, all of the call in and the off duty EMS and like, so there were maybe 30 people like who were waiting for him to come in and, uh, oh my God, it was just wild. Um, got it downloading. That's good. Swamp, let me know when it's done downloading. So like in the next day or whatever, just send me a, a short email and say, Hey, good. So when it's done, let me know. Uh, Swamp. Um, so I've been, I was in, in different debriefings from, uh, drownings, to suicides, to vehicle accidents and things like that. And, uh, to recreational accidents, um, we have a ski hill by us. And that was, that was one of the debriefings. Um, they would take a lot of time. Um, they were usually, not usually they were held in different places. So if it was, it could be in a fire hall, like if it was a smaller rural fire department, um, you know, they would pull the trucks out and you'd debrief in the fire hall or, here locally, we have a hospital, um, and they would have different small, like, conference-type rooms and you'd debrief in there. But uh, it was amazing. And one of the things that you would – well, there were a few rules to being a critical instant debriefer. Um, one is that what you wore, you – there was a strict dress code, and it was done so people were less likely to remember you. Um, so you dressed typically kind of like in black or black and white, like no logos, no insignias, no nothing, no, I think any ties had to be like one color. I mean, there were very specific rules to what you'd wear to a debriefing. Um, so, and part of, part of that was that, you know, these people will see you in the community and you, you don't want them to remember you. Um, but that was part of it. And then the, the second part was that you would, um, you would, you would tell people, well, I'll, I'll talk about how this actually went, but you would tell people we're going to, I'm going to help you. And it's like me and two, three other people. I'm going to help you get to a place that's different than where you're at right now. I'm not saying I'm going to get you to a better place. I'm going to help you get to a different place. And you had, you had things that you were, you were very, you were taught, right? Always ask people repeatedly, like, what are you going to do when you get home? What are you going to do tomorrow? That you had people start to think what, um, that the transition, right, beyond this. And if people weren't doing that, if people weren't giving that to you, you had to make, uh, there were counselors always outside of the room. There were other people like a counseling, you had to make them aware immediately of like, Hey, this person, like um, I have concerns, right? Because they're not telling me what they're going to do when they get, get home. And that usually didn't happen. Um, but, but when you, you'd come in and do a debriefing, it would usually take uh, anywhere between two and five hours to do that. It was extremely exhausting, mentally exhausting to do the debriefing. And you'd be provided with the, um, the a copy of the dispatch, um, the dispatcher's notes. So what you would do is you would go through this 
from the moment the call came into dispatch to the very basically end of it, right? So the call would come in and then it would say like, who was dispatched? And then you'd say, okay, so it says like EMS was dispatched. And so who in here, who is on that? Who, and then, you know, those people and, and then it would come down and say, okay, then fire. And then it looks like a second EMS crew and then whatever. And so like, as people would be introduced on dispatch in your, in your chronological printout, you, they would, if they were there, um, you could only be there if you were part of the instant. So if you were, I mean, so if you, if you were like uh, the police chief and you weren't there, you were not part of the debriefing. Only people who were actually responding were part of the debriefing. Um, and, and it was, it was always voluntary. Although most people attend it, um, some people wouldn't attend, um, you know, and so, but anyway, um, so you go through chronologically and then people would, would talk about, you know, when, when they came on scene, what they experienced it and what it, what it did is it, it helped them see the, the picture of everything that had happened. Um, and then it also, so that was part of it. And, uh, it also, um, gave people a sense that other they, they weren't alone in this, right? That other people were picking up pieces at different times when they got brought into things or different handoffs. And it's kind of hard to explain. Like I wasn't, I'd almost have to devote a show to that, which is probably very well worth doing a podcast of what it was like to be a critical instant debriefer. And um, I mean, and I can't talk specifically about any of the, the, the briefings that I did, although, I mean, they, uh, just th these these in depth. Um, I I don't know, um, but uh, I I do remember leaving. Um, I do re Andrew. Hey, so let me get to Andrew on a scale of sixty nine to four twenty. How bad Texas? Yeah. So one of the things I did I didn't do I guess after um, uh, w w with uh, with uh, the elementary. Um, school shooting in Texas is I, I, I really, I, I stayed off social media for a day. Um, the reason is that um, you don't know, right? The information doesn't really start to to clear up until at least a day. And then forensically, it'll take longer for that to, to become more precise. But uh, as someone who's written like, you know, the School of Errors and been on PBS, it's difficult to post um I try not to do anything with the book because then people can say, oh, you're just trying to promote your book on the back of a tragedy. And that's not the case. So I tried to to not do anything with the book until at least a day or two out of just to make people aware. But then um, I'm trying to, I, I like today I came in and, and was posting links to my PBS presentations, which are free. And they've aired in San Antonio just recently. So I posted the links to those. Um, but I... You know, you can't be silent, right, as a school safety expert, but also you have to, you have to be very careful that you're not uh, coming off as, as someone who's trying to get all their stuff um, promoted uh, through this this uh, massacre, right? So it's a fine line. Um, so Andrew is saying it looks like it shows that the cops say outside. Yeah, so that's the early information that I've been tracking also. And that, I mean, all of that will forensically come out in, in the report which was the problem at Columbine, um, Columbine, um, Denver SWAT. It was, it took a long, long time before people came into the building. They didn't know where other people were in the building, other crews. And, and, uh, and, and so this is really, um, so, yeah. So this, this is to, to hear these stories where parents were saying, you know, give me a gun and, and some, you know, tactical armor and let me go in and, I mean, if this does happen to be the situation where, um, you know, law enforcement was was there and there wasn't an attempt to, um, you know, intervene with this, um, I mean, I, I, the, it's, it's going to be uh, just a, a catastrophic, um, uh, you know, you go back to Columbine. I mean, 
that w was was a very rare event before that to have a mass casualty, very planned out uh, tag team shooter event prior to that. But like now, again, to to not engage. Um, so it is, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I've I've been reading, uh, I think, verified accounts uh, of a mother who said she was handcuffed trying to to get to the school. And I understand uh, police trying to keep a perimeter, but um, but I I don't know. Um, especially, I, I mean, I, I I guess I I I, I just don't know. Um, I. I think there'll be obvious we're in a time of, you know, people taking cell phone video and uh, once this whole timeline comes together uh, to see what, uh, you know, what all develop, but, um, but it is the, the whole idea. I, so I worked with ta tactical entry teams, right? I have that in school of airs. I have a photo of myself in tactical gear, working with tactical entry teams. Once a team of three typically would be on site um, that the, that was in my experiences with tactical teams is, is the first three would go in. Um, and the, it, it does seem that there were many more, you know, the, the first three were there pretty fast. And then, uh, w you know, why you would not uh, come into this, this building um, or I, I, I just don't know. I, I think these, these uh, questions, this again will all forensically be laid out. Um, dime information. I was just thinking that all problem time. I wrote about that in my book. Yeah, dime information. I did dime information with uh, with uh, tactical entry teams. So yeah, um, all you know, I'm very well experienced from a uh, from you know hours and hours and hours of of doing that with tactical entry teams. So uh, this this is horrific. And to think, right, that, uh, yeah, parents are, are attempting to go in and they're, they're handcuffing parents and there's, you know, video of police with tasers, you know, if people are trying to get close to the building. I understand, right? But at the same time, I mean, now, now I'm kind of looking at this of saying, you know, so this was, was confined to what a, a fourth grade classroom, which had an adjacent classroom. You know, what if this, the, you know, the shooter would have left the fourth grade classroom to go to other classrooms granted like they all should have had secure doors and things like that but like um yeah you know and there was there was no attempt to intervene you know at 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever i mean just looking at where this could have gone um is is horrific um so um yeah, SAS is saying they wait for SWAT or whatever, but I, that kind of goes back to, I guess, the, the Columbine and the Denver SWAT, but like the teams that I've trained with in Wisconsin, which have been numerous teams, and again, I have video, I have picture picture in the book of one of the, you know, where I'm done up in, well, let me actually find it here, but um, that's just not the way it would go, right? And a lot of 421 schools in Wisconsin, I don't know how many schools are in Texas, but, you know, these are all uh, small, you know, for the most part, rural schools. Here I am. Ugh. There I am. Uh, in tactical, that was a day. We did like eight, 10 hours of tactical entry. So, um so the thing is like they they know um that they they need to do uh they need to do something um so i i don't get it like we it was always my understanding as a school official and working with multiple uh training with teams is the first three three in um and you're not gonna i mean swat would be but you're not going to have time to uh, to wait for a SWAT. It was it was three in, if anything, to distract um, the shooter or shooters. So, yeah, Tara Beslin. Yeah, I ha I I um I know about that. I don't have the book on it, but I know about the uh, the the Tara Beslin. Yeah, wasn't that three or four hundred? 
fatalities assessed. Um, but, uh, but so this brings up a huge question, which is going to be, what if you do kind of, so apparently the back door was, was open in the school. I guess we'll know more later. Schools, um, there's no federal law that requires that schools lock their doors. Only one state, I don't know, it might be Kentucky, could be Alabama. I, I need to know this. Like I, I did a presentation on this and I forgot what the state was. But as of 2020, only one state required that schools have their doors, their entry, and then their classroom doors locked during instructional time. And uh, that they actually had somebody who would go school to school from the, the state and would check and would actually like find these schools if they didn't do that. Only one school. So, um, you know, so not having doors locked, typically locked doors that meet the fire code and, and things like that are going to uh, be very uh, increased the safety of the facility significantly. Um, but yeah, um, I also do, I went to a school um, that had a, a shooter who held a classroom at um, at gunpoint for several hours before taking his own life. Uh, I did a debriefing uh, at that school after that event, um, and that was um, that was yeah, there was uh, snipers that were set up outside and things like that. But uh, but yeah, I I don't I I really as more information is coming out on this and as again it will be the, the providence providence right where. It's the order of events. So, like, was was there something? Because then the grandma called police, like after she was shot. So then that came in, and then they would have had a description of the vehicle, and the vehicle crashed near the school, and did they fire shots outside of the school or not? And so it's like once all these things come in line. But I think it as working as a school safety expert, there's right a, a lot of things. It seems that we're in place or at the school did correctly. I mean, they, with their lockdowns, announcements, things like that. But um, it is, um, if if your law enforcement isn't responding to neutralize a shooter, there's only so long you can go unless you completely have a fortified area, um, which, you know, some of these schools in Oklahoma bought these bulletproof igloos but again, I mean, once somebody enters a classroom, that's kind of the end of things. So, um, but yeah, I, I, it's it's really, I mean, if if law enforcement isn't uh, isn't going to uh, engage um, a shooter that it, it, in that situation, then I, what what does your safety protocol look like if somebody comes into the building? You know. I, I don't know. So, so I'll be looking to get more uh, information on this, but I, I think this is going to, um, I think this is going to, to uh, bring forward a change in um, school safety shooter protocol because litigation um, and schools, I mean, if, if this is, schools have got to figure out where their local PD is, stands on this stuff, right? Um, and uh, because if, if you, if you, because again, what it, what it seems like, and I think we have enough information out right now um, that I've been going through is this this you know very delayed entry which eventually became border patrol with a teacher unlocking a door right that this uh, uh you know and now there's some backtracking of saying well they believe most of the fatalities happened within the first few minutes well that's to see that in print before there's been autopsies and you know medical forensic revealed that is that is a statement which is trying to throw people off of saying well it wouldn't have mattered if they would have gone in that's a horrible statement to make so you, I start to see some of these come out and I'm like, okay, they are, uh, there's excuses, right? So um, SAS is saying cops are seven minutes away. They set up a perimeter according to, okay, got that. SAS, if you want to read, sorry, you got it. All pro, 
Yeah, no excuse what is for hostage situation. The active shooters need immediate response. Um, right, right. Um, Sast, one too many. I live 50 miles from Newton. Can I get our town dispatch police to all of high schools immediately? I've kept two at each school a year. That is, um, Sast, the very least of uh, your town can do. So, yeah. I can tell you, like, um, the police officers that I, I had trained with that I know um, all, uh, all tell me, right, that if it would be them um, and, or, you know, or typically if they had an opportunity or it would be the first three, which would be usually pretty, pretty quick if it's um, in at least an urban or suburban area. And that would be your, your diamond team that would come in. Um, but it, it wouldn't be, you know, what we what we saw here. So um, I I just I don't know. I have been trying to, to play this out too. Does this mean that? Um, I mean, because cameras are cheap right now. I mean, it's not like twenty years ago. The cost of does it mean schools will have a you know camera systems throughout the schools? You can see what's happening in every classroom. But again, that. I'm not saying that's a solution. I'm saying you'll probably see that pushed in legislation. You'll probably see people advocate for that, but again, it doesn't change it. Um, again, we're talking about this as a classroom, but what if it what happened is kids were coming in and, and out of recess or at a bus stop or something like that. And um, But yeah, you have to have that, uh, that police um, response to neutralize the threat and the more, again, I think about this and I've kind of looked at the layout of the school that's been available and things like that, I'm like, whoa, like what What if this, you know, the shooter would have left that classroom and breached into another classroom or breached into, you know, a third area or something like that uh, because people weren't coming in. So um, it is it is a horrific, a horrific situation. Um, and again, I think this is one where you're going to look at your school protocols outside of maybe having a door that was open, um, and which we don't know for sure. But um, and you're going to say, you know, things things were pretty intact as a as a school protocol. Um, but uh, yeah, I I I I just at, at a at a loss, and I'm glad also I didn't I didn't make post about this yesterday and gave myself time to uh, let more of the information come in. Um, but I, I have been following some of the people that I know uh, that personally know uh, who have had children killed in, in school shootings and I've been watching their social media and, uh, and kind of been in, in touch with some of them. But uh, yeah, I, there are, there's a few things. One is, just schools need to have locked doors and all classrooms need to be locked during instructional time. Now, granted, yes, things happen. This kids come to school, leave school, recess, things like that. But as a, as a bare minimum, like those things just need to happen. Um, and then like, we just need to have a schools need to have a precise understanding and, and of what a, likely police response would be. And I think that also has to happen from insurance companies too, of understanding uh, and expectations or, or saying to the school um, strictly from a liability. And I cover, you know, this in, in my legal courses, not this ex exactly, but um, we, this is a discussion that, you know, it, if do you have to have your own, security or and what is your own security's expectation if if there is a breached environment and uh you know someone with a firearm who is is um threatening or sh bringing harm to people um so uh are you again are you then because part of this is not just employing police officers or having police officers. I mean, there was a police officer at Parkland, right? I mean, that's that you have people and then that they are in, engaging to stop, uh, to neutralize um, the attacker. So, um, but uh, Andrew, the teachers union should threaten nationwide strikes until something, uh, you know, like this NEA 
in AFT, National Education Association, National Federation Teachers, uh, this would be a moment, right, to to say, yeah, we need we need to see um, we need to see changes. And also, in my PBS presentation in 2019, I broke down who's in charge of school safety from a federal to a local level, and you know there there's very little from a federal standpoint, very little. People assume that there is, but there's very little. And there isn't, uh, there aren't federal dollars. Now you'll see grants that'll come to schools and they'll mostly be short-term and for fortification or something like that, you know, but, um, or mental health, uh, but you will, uh, there isn't anything federal that is allocated into schools and then uh, gets usually handed down to the states. The states sometimes will do things, other times will hand it down to the, the districts. So in my state, there's 421 districts. And so my state, for example, requires that schools submit a safety plan every January, which basically is a, it, they do it online. It's very quick, five, 10 minutes to complete it. And, and then they need to present, I think, at a board meeting that they held a drill with the police on an active shooter. And it's very minimum. But so when you, send into the state as the Department of Justice here in Wisconsin, you send in your school safety, your school blueprint. So, right. Um, and the other thing is you, you send in your safety plan. Now, what is the safety plan is very ambiguous. And there isn't a template for it. And the other part is the state never comes to you and says, this is a good plan, or we're going to help you with this plan like we're going to come on site. They never do that. So you, it's just a task that people complete. Um, so, yeah. Um, but again, in this in this situation and going back to Parkland and, and you know, I guess going back to Columbine, but uh, this, this really seems like we absolutely don't have clarity on what uh, law enforcement's role is their actions are going to be when they re are on scene um, and there is, you know, somebody armed in the building, right? And this isn't a hostage situation, um, that there needs to be clarity, uh, clarity to that. Now, I know police departments that would, you know, would have been in that building in seven minutes, right? Um, so I... I think there needs to be, so I, I don't know. I, I feel like this, this is going to, this is a tipping point. Um, and I feel that it's a tipping point this time because it, it's going to be a tipping point on what the police response was. Um, not so much as what the, the school did. If there was this open door, for example, in the, the back of the school or breach door, um, so, wow. Um, and all pro Lemton saying sworn officers have a duty to intervene. A security guard making $10 an hour might lack motivation. Right. Yeah. I've seen many people, you know, post today to, uh, moves that, I mean, if, if you're wearing the badge and you're there, like in, at a school and, and there's a shooter inside, this is, you've, this is, you've got to do this. Um, it has to say your average sworn officer has no obligation to move in arms away. Only specialized units have signed up for that. So, yeah, again, and again, it, I guess it goes, it would be very maybe department sp specific on that. Uh, the departments I trained with, um, you know, all had the, the first three philosophy, right? Whether it was them, state patrol or whoever would be the first three. Um, that they would form and do an entry. Um, that was at least, I mean, what they were saying. So this is why they make a perimeter. Yeah. So now the thing is like the perimeter, but at, at what point in this did you have a perimeter and did you have other people there to make an entry? Um, so I don't know. The, 
you having somebody yeah in in inside of the building um yeah heath is saying school shooter are not hostage takers they should never be treated as such yeah they aren't hostage um takers so andrew's saying to ask cops waiting outside while muskers have any means those cops are an accessory so this will be i mean i would expect um we'll have you know years of litigation we'll have civil um litigation against the uh, police department was this an issue of i mean the local police department would have had authority um so this is it's kind of strange to me that border patrol entered right because they wouldn't have authority over um, that entry and so I'm, I'm just trying to figure this this out as this comes in but um so says senior premier in this case yeah and that's in most cases right like at sandy hook there were people uh, rushing toward the building but uh i i don't yeah i i'm going to, you know forensically i'm going to go through this i'm i'm starting to take notes when i teach my superintendent class in fall you know the discussion with uh, my soups is to say you know if this happens with your built building like what are your police telling you and again we have uh we have 421 districts you know half those are rural where there might be one police officer on duty and you know otherwise it's county responding or somebody in the area and you know you, know, you can't you have the you know, 2200 school buildings here in wisconsin you can have these buildings that you know it's going to take a long time uh, Andrew saying cops should have handed their guns to the parents. So, yeah, I, I think there was there were some parents asking for that. You know, so it, it's I bring my own success. I had a I had a case study. This now this is you know it's different, but it kind of gets people thinking along the same lines. And uh, I, I I've run this one the last few years in my superintendent class. And the case study is that um, and this is a true case. This actually, I mean, most of the case studies I develop are all like based upon authentic situations. Um, but uh, here we go. I have a, a case study where it's a rural elementary school and the students um, out at recess, the students are out at recess and suddenly they realize one of the students is missing. And it's a student with autism elementary student and they believe the student has has walked like into a wooded area at the back of a playground and so they notify you know the the, the person out at recess people out at recess and they they quickly you know get all the kids and they're trying to figure out where this this kid is and so they believe this kid right has wandered away and then there are a few like variables one is um there's a river not too far away and the school is 20 minutes away from the next school building. So it's rural, which is very realistic and authentic for my area. Again, this actually happened. Um, so the school calls 911, says that they have a student who is missing, student has autism, um, and they're going... So the school doesn't really know how to do a search. Like there's a certain... You have to be trained to search, right? So they're trying to get a description of the student. They're trying to get guidance on what to to do. Right from nine one one, should we, you know, send some people out to look for the kid, or does it, will it, the child feel like they're being chased and they'll put them further away or what? It, whatever. But um, but yeah, it is. Um, so the scenario then is somebody comes over the drone, who heard this over their scanner, and they say, "Hey, like I have this drone with a camera." Um, I can get it up in the air and I can start looking for this kid. Give me some description where the kid might be. So then you as principal at this site, what do you say? And it's always a split in the class where half the people say, no, I wouldn't do it because we don't, we've never practiced with somebody coming in with a drone who's just like a neighbor. Right. Um, and so it, it's just because it's not part of their, their, protocol and the other people say yeah i'd absolutely do it it's another resource um 
you know, we can get, maybe we can spot where this kid is. We can get people out there, to, you know, to keep this kid out of harm's way. So yeah, we'll do it. But you know, what if, what if this drone captures footage and, you know, the child is deceased or something like that? I mean, so you, you get people back and forth and ultimately you come back to discretion and best interest of the child. And, um, you know, it, it really comes down to, um, everybody has to make their own call on this, but I said, you know, if I was the principal, I would use that resource. Right. And I would deal with the consequences later because in my perspective, especially, uh, you know, at the time I started the case study to have a drone available to, you know, to, with video that you can see these, these areas, um, yeah, was potentially going to benefit the situation versus uh, be a negative impact on the situation. So, um, but yeah, it's interesting where people go on that. And then, you know, some people be like, you know, well, what if I got in trouble with my superintendent or could I be like fired because I let somebody participate in a rescue who, you know, wasn't part of our staff or part of a formal rescue team or so, um, Keith is saying they held the parents back for 40 minutes. So that's what I'm also hearing the, re, you know, so we gotta, this will be very thoroughly forensically put together in a final report. And, uh, but this, that is, you know, of course you'll say you got a perimeter, but oh my God. Um, I, yeah, it's, this is really, uh, really difficult to, to kind of understand uh, what went down. Uh, Wrangle Star put up a video response to such situation. Highly recommend it. Okay, thanks, Sast. Upper Levington government is always afraid to make executive decisions. They need approval committee. Yeah. Um, so Upper Levington, in my book, School of Airs, I talked about um, on 9-11. So this is, this is a... This needs to be talked about more. And I have a I have two chapters devoted to it. And I worked at the city of New York, their department of planning. On 9-11, there were 500,000 people rescued by boat from lower Manhattan Battery Park in nine hours. No one had ever trained for that. Um, some of these were Coast Guard boats, about half, more than half were tugs. Some were ferry boats, some were personal boats. Um, but they never trained for this. Um, not, they weren't all government. Uh, Admiral Loy of the Coast Guard um, realized, right, that people needed to get off of Manhattan. The roads were shut down, the bridges. Um, at that time, they still thought the attacks were ongoing. This wasn't a thought that they had concluded, right, that the attacks were ongoing. And, right, the harbor could have been mined or there could have been more planes and coming or... Uh, who knows? And um, Admiral Loy, and look at the movie. Um, oh, um, let me see here. Let me find it. It's, it's like 10 minutes long. Um, uh, it's called, here it is. It's a uh, boat lift um, on YouTube. Um, Harriet by Tom Hanks. So it's all, I don't know, eight or 10 minutes long. Um, and it, it talks about this, this rescue, the actual like nuts and bolts of this rescue, right? Um, so Admiral Loy says, hey, if you have a boat, if you can get over here, help. And that was it. And people figured it out how to do the rescue. Um, 500,000 people rescued, no one died in the rescue, no one was seriously injured in the rescue. Um, even people with disabilities, you know, were carried over makeshift, you know, onto the boats and, um, people weren't sued after that. The captains weren't sued. The city wasn't sued and all from this executive order from Admiral Loy, um, saying, if you have a boat, if you can get people off of lower Manhattan, get over here and do what you can. Um, amazing, right? That that happened in 2001, um, would it happen today, you know? And that's the thing is I, 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 I look at that, you know, when people will say, well, you know, there's all this cumbersome decision-making and different multi-agency stuff. Like there was no multi-agency stuff on that rescue. 
the system developed. It was Coast Guard with police boats, with fire boats, with leisure boats, with tugs doing a rescue and tearing off doors to make makeshift gangplanks and, you know, whatever, and taking people over to Hoboken or dropping them off. Yeah, you're going to enjoy it. It's about eight minutes long. But, um, but I, I, you know, I got, I wrote two chapters about that and worked with the city of New York and also kind of looked at the psychological side of that. But um, again, 500,000 people and it was successful and why? And I, and I think we come back to this. It's like, you have to make a decision. Someone has to make a decision and be the alpha and go with it. And if there are consequences, then there are consequences. When you assume certain positions, um, you have to make executive decisions. And, and, you know, that was Admiral Loy of the Coast Guard making that executive decision. So, but, you know, what if, you know, two boats would have collided, right, is in the harbor as they're doing this rescue and 200 people die and sunken boat or something on it, you know. But, um, but I think uh, there has to, there, there needs to be absolute clarity from like uh, definitely Parkland and now uh, Evaldi of of what what is the what is the expectation of of law enforcement interfacing uh, with a known active shooter event in a school. Um, so I thought you know Columbine was kind of an outlier, um, and but now you know what what is and. And, and for schools to clearly know this, I mean, if if there is going to be this approach of we're going to prioritize a perimeter over um, entry, then I guess that needs to be upfront up known. Um, so, yeah, all pro. Good point. Yeah, one million. What? Right. Watch the video, Boat Lift. And then again, I interviewed... It's very well put together in School of Airs. And I looked at the psychological side of like, you know, people went to the Harbor, Harbor expecting a rescue. And right, they, but actually the boats coming in could have just been trying to get off of the water because of what they saw, you know, like they thought they'd be next. But um, this whole, the thing is um, also in a school position, you have a very high level of immunity. Not that your school is making this decision because this would this would default into police, but uh, but you would think law enforcement like maybe this needs to be codified more overtly in law. Maybe that needs to happen. Um, and if that would happen, I think it would have to be like a federal law, really, um, not necessarily a state law, but a, a federal a federal law um, that would give give more. Um, um, I don't, I don't know if it would be protection from civil liability for law enforcement or security intervening in a school. I don't know, but uh, something's going to change here. Uh, something is going to, to change because in this, this again, with all of school safety, let's say, let's say for example, that the, the door was locked in the back and that he was able to, to, you know, with his weapon, you know, shoot out the lock and get into the building. So like then the building was secure and you're still able to get into the building and, and breach into a room or something like that. Or, I mean, um, it's, it's like, you know, at some point where does, where does your right law enforcement intervention like happen? Um, so the evacuation in Dunkirk needs to be studied more. Sass one too many. How many would have died without the civil? That's exactly right. So Sass, um, I have a couple books called American Dunkirk and like Calling All Boats and stuff like that. I have a, just a book specifically about Dunkirk on my bookshelf back here. But um, so um, Dunkirk happened over, what was it, multiple days. But again, it was a civilian flotilla. And as you said, if you wouldn't have embraced that as a government and a military at that point, you could have lost a hundred thousand plus soldiers. And you know, the, the thing which is so fascinating to me with, with 
the harbor, the boat lift on 9-11 is. It, um, it just developed, right, spontaneously, and it existed for nine hours. 500,000 people were rescued, and then it just dissipated. Like, they don't even have the names of all of the boats. I went through all the archives, and when I was, was working with, um, the, with New York, the, they said, we're pretty sure we know most of the boats. We don't know all of the boats. And back then, I mean, it was before everything was like city uh, cell phone video and, and all of that. I mean, um, so, you know, there are boats, people that participated that probably are never, will never be known um, or people who had actually been rescued and things like that. And, and, uh, but it was amazing, right? How, again, it goes to Admiral Loy and then the people under him believing that, okay, he's got our back if this goes sideways. Right. And, uh, and, but, you know, people are smart in, in, in the system in, in the moment. And again, this was not a completed event. I mean, they were believing at any moment there would be, they could be, you know, mine detonated in the Harbor, that the plane could come in and somebody could be shooting at them from shore. I mean, like this was a very in the moment. So, so I think I, th that's where if I'm interviewed on, on this, I'm, I'm going to come now that more of this is coming out. Um, I would talk about the 9-11 rescue, right? And you, you are, are, are we lacking or are police departments lacking or are there municipalities or insurers or whatever are, is it that there needs to be a more precise, um, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, um, we've got your back in these situations. So, um, Sass is saying the fact that officials and police don't want the community involved is a huge, huge problem. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I think what is, what's extremely damaging right now is the timeline for this, um, has gotten less precise over the last 24 hours. So now we're hearing the shooter wasn't engaged, which I don't know what that really means, right? Before he went to the building and then, you know, like people on scene and just other things. I mean, but there's a, there's going to be enough, like there's, there's a section of um, scanner that's missing, like 20 minutes of scanner chat is no longer publicly available or, but you have enough people who will be there, yeah. You know that this this will will definitely um, all come together. This mosaic, right? There's 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 too many people that have pieces of information. Uh, but uh, I mean, it'll, it'll probably be a year before there'll be a full report with a timeline. But uh, so Andrew's saying future pol uh, police recruits will not be men because real men. No police are soft. Uh, Sass is saying, I contacted the superintendent of schools in our district and offered to submit to every test and training they had to protect the kids in my free time. Crickets, many offered. So, yeah. Um, I think there, there will be definite uh, calls for this, right? There'll be People will say, well, if, if the level of protection wasn't there from law enforcement or when they respond it like then who do we who do we do who do we hire like and then what protections are we going to give them um for you know as as i guess liability and these types of things um so it this reminds me of cajun navy relief and like texas navy relief and stuff like that the kind of cajun navy but they're actually like cajun navy relief is a formal 5013C or 5031C or whatever. But um, so when they would come into areas to do rescues during hurricane, like Katrina and things like that, not Katrina, hurricanes like Harvey and Irma, um, the, the town would be like um, flooded out, right? A small town, maybe like 3,000 people. And the, the fire department had one boat. So I did I, on the safety doc. I have Katie Pashan. I think I did three different shows with Katie um, for different rescues. 
Um, and she was with kids you need relief, but the town would be flooded, wouldn't be, or would be flooding, right? And you'd have like 2,000 people who'd need to leave, and the, the town would have one boat. And uh, they would initially hold off. They would not want Cajun Navy Relief there. Cajun Navy Relief would have like 100 boats ready to go. And they'd have like Zello apps. They could like take in the calls from people in dispatch and Garmin and GPS and all that ready to go. They had boats that could go like in shallow water. or They could even like bottom out on to streets, stuff like that, and all this stuff. So they'd be there ready to go. And, he, and it didn't take long. But the question was like, who's liable if anybody gets hurt during a rescue? And and uh, it didn't take long in the community to be like, go in and do what you have to do, you know. Um, but they, the some of the governments, some of the legislators, I don't know, Louisiana, um, I think it, Texas, Alabama, they tried to um, legislate the uh, these, these civilian rescue forces. Like you had to have so much training and you had to like have a, a registration with the state and like a background check and like, they're just trying to kill it. Right. Because there's two things. One is, well, what's a liability if somebody like takes a boat and goes over a live wire and now everybody in the boat is dead and whatever. And, and they're saying, Oh, they should have never been allowed in there in the first place. Um, I think that's part of it. And I think the other part, quite frankly, in talking with a lot of people <laughs> over the last number of years on this, who have been involved in these rescues is, you know, the, uh, you know, FEMA wants to run this and they just typically don't, they're not effective at doing it versus the, the faster, more nimble uh, grassroots. I always said FEMA should be there for staging to clear the way, to make warehouse space and things like that, um, and to to clear the way for these organizations to come in. So, but uh but yeah, I don't. Something's going. To, something's going to give with uh, with this. Yeah, jurisdictional struggles. So and Sass, it's interesting because like with Cage and Navy Relief, sometimes it never happened. Like the communities would fully, you know, the mayor and the police chief would fully let you know vet them. Even behind the scenes, right? Like FEMA would know the only way they could do things. So FEMA would kind of work, but wouldn't want to publicly put it out there. And uh, because then what if something goes wrong? You know, well, the other part is like, what if something goes right? What if something goes really right? You know, like you, you rescue, you know, all of these people. And um, uh, so I, yeah, th and there were huge uh, jurisdictional issues with the Bahamas. Um, I don't know which, which hurricane went through the Bahamas a couple of years. Maybe if you put that in, but, you know, we're uh, just a mess. Um, in a disaster, everything already went wrong. Yeah, so, so you're right. So you're coming into a, a compromised situation, <laughs> right? Um, you're not working from a stable baseline. That's a really good point, Sast. Um, I should have wrote. A, I should have put that into um, to a School of Airs, but uh, but that, it's a very good talking point, right? So you're already into a compromised situation. Do what you can do to. Um, add stability to it in the best way you think you can. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't. But again, you're trained, you have assets, you have, you know, you've got to go for it. But uh, Cajun Navy relief, for example, is, is still strong and robust, but, um, you know, we, we, we need to make sure that those organizations don't go by the wayside. Um, now that's not, exactly that's a branch off of kind of where I'm, I'm talking about now but i think you're going to have these discussions happening all over the country and school boards and stuff will you know they'll say well what if i mean because churches do it um i mean there are churches in my area that, that do this where people volunteer to bring their weapons to mass to protect the mass so i think you're going to have kind of that thing extend out to parents or community. And I guess, how do you, what does that look like? Or how do you vet that? Or are you going to have some, you know, teachers or, um, I just, yeah, again, yeah, I mean, it's like, whether, whether it be, be this or, uh, um, I, I just think, um, 
I, I just think we're there. Um, so <sighs> that's saying we need to get back to constitutional militias. I know that term has a bad connotation now, but it, it used to mean the citizenry. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to just, yeah, yeah. Pull in as much, um, data as I can, you know, from, from what is, what is hap what will be happening around the, the country, um, now with, uh, so after Sandy Hook, Flagler Beach, Florida, a mom, I, cause I presented on this. So in 2013, I did my first school safety presentation on PBS and that was basically, uh, to inform the public following Sandy Hook because PBS did not have a, a current uh, school, national like school safety presentation at that time. So my 2013, May 2013 was really to educate people um, post Sandy Hook, right? It wasn't about Sandy Hook specifically, but, um, but I talked about how after Sandy Hook, a mother in Flagler Beach, um, Florida paid for a school, uh, police li liaison officer, police officer to be at her kid's school for the rest of the year. So like January to the end of the year, the parent picked up the tab. So this, I don't know what happened after that, that the school hire someone and, and, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know what this what this looks like. Um, but I would, and I'd have to think, right. That, uh, you know, if something else happens, uh, that is in a similar, uh, blueprint to, to this or to Parkland, I mean, then, I mean, absolutely. How, I mean, how is, is there, there not a, a, uh, federal protection act put into place. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm kind of, I'm just, I'm kind of surprised right now, right. That people, that's not where people are going with, with the uh, discussions. Right. I mean, so Andrew is saying Massachusetts used national guard to drive buses, but not to car schools. True. Right. Um, Upper Leventon, my state still has defense force, which is technically a militia under the governor, but they seem pretty worthless. Yeah. Um, and our federal government has way too much control over the states um, for a long time. But um, so for states to, to do something that is a robust defense force or quote unquote militia that is not a national guard uh, is going to be very difficult. I think uh, you're seeing that in South Dakota. Um, Christy, Governor Nome is running into obstacles with that. But there was an old organization back in the day. I believe they were called the Committees of Safety and they were militia of the citizenry. So, yeah. Um, so, I, again, something is going to, something is going to happen from a legislative standpoint on this. I mean, states will do it, but there could be something federal. And I think it has to do with uh, a, a protocol or a expectation or a, some liability or, but something I think will happen. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I so I, I wish I was was contacted and and you know there so you'll I'll see CNN and you know these places that will interview and and they'll um, they they'll interview people and they're usually like oh there's a professor at whatever university who studies school shootings or active shooters and then I'll I'll read the interview and and the person will be like you know well technically school violence has been decreasing in the last few years and I'll be like that's absolutely not true. I mean, yes, technically, this person, you know, is, is, you know, they, they are, these experts will argue that uh, the statistic, right? 
what you see reported from for states of uh, you know youth violence is going down. I'm like, well, the reality is um, the reports, yes, are reflecting that. The reality is it's not happening at all. I, you know, I teach these classes. You know, I, I know. You know, I have a, the sample. I have the students who are the principals or the superintendents, but abeyance agreements. And I did a whole podcast on that. Very thorough, very thorough blog post on that. Schools don't suspend because um, they don't want the numbers on their school report cards. So they, they do abeyance agreements or say, basically, don't do it again. And it never gets reported anywhere. And it's it's for threats of violence. It's uh, kids bringing drugs, you know, everything, including fentanyl. I mean, and, and it's just these things never get reported. So it looks like things are getting much better. And they're not. They're just not being reported. Abeyance agreements um, vanish. They don't stay on a student's record. They're never a part of the student's record. After a quarter or a semester, they're gone. Um, they're never... Uh, report to the school board, to local police. They're not reported to the state. They're not reported to the feds. So you basically create this entire system of monitoring, or not monitoring, but this of of uh, responding to school violence that never shows up on the books. And I get flack for that. I'm very uh, and I in abeyance agreements are not part of um, education law. They're part of criminal law. And, you know, somebody goes on parole or a suspended sentence. That's all abeyance agreements. So this just got grifted in at some point, maybe 25 years ago. And what they call them, too, is it's a um, pre-expulsion hearing. So you don't really exp expel a student or things like that. And uh, I could see the numbers in our state. Um, when I was bringing up our state data from like 2010 to 2012, I, I looked at this just like three days ago. Because uh, I analyzed it, and you would have districts that would go from um, suspensions of, let's say, at a high school, whatever. They had 80 suspensions for the last 10 years, and then it suddenly goes to like five. And then it's like, well, what happened? Um, and you see this all around the state. What happened is the lawyers were telling the schools, use this abeyance agreement, put it, put it in your policy. You can type in abeyance, we just go to the blog post at Safety PhD. Dot com type in abeyance blog posts won't take long at all um, to read it's very well done I mean, take it three or four minutes to read through it type in abeyance in the search and you'll find up the the show I did show's really good on that one too by the way um, but because uh, I, I put in a clip of a teacher in a district who was they were using abeyance agreements and she resigned she was teacher of the year and she says so violent so anyway the, what the news does right is they bring in and, and then they they interview and and what what you need to do is interview me, right? And which like New York Post used to interview me all the time for school safety stuff, but then they had turnover and I don't know they go with different people now. But um, and and yeah, I mean, let's talk about the fact that there is not a federal law that schools should have locked doors, um, and there's only one state that has that law. I don't know, but it's not, it's not Florida. It's not Texas. I know that I think it's Alabama or Kentucky, but, um, and, and that state actually has an enforcement officer who goes to schools and checks and, um, and does site schools if they, they don't have this. And then this, there was a lot of pushback. They wanted to eliminate that position. The schools are very angry. So yeah, dressing like Zelensky, this is exactly <laughs> this is the same shirt. We both have the same exact shirt. Yeah, it is. Um, but um, so uh, Sast is saying the population increased by 130 million in 50 years. They never talk about per capita. Yeah, it's a good point. All these things too. Yeah, you're right. Sast went too many. Obama did a doc. The second, third, fourth chance. Pro yeah, it was. It it amplified. I would say. When I entered administration in like 2000, um, abeyance agreements is, existed. They weren't, they were pretty rare. Um, so it's like if a kid brought some marijuana to school and the policy was like any drugs on, you know, school campus, you'd, you'd be expelled. Um, and maybe for a first offense, they would 
have a meeting, the principal and stuff like parents, stuff like that in the school board. And then they would do a, um, this abeyance agreement of say, don't let it happen again. And if you don't do this for the next year, we'll forget about it. Um, so, I mean, but if it was an egregious act 20 years ago, like a school violence or something like that, um, it, a band's agreement definitely was off the table. Now it is, they're, they're there for everything. Yeah. Beating up other kids, threats, all of that. A band's agreements come into play because the schools don't want their suspension numbers um, to look high or to look authentic because parents shop school district to school district through open enrollment and they they can pull up the number of suspensions it's on a school report card that each school gets and or each district gets so um so they don't report it out and i think abeyance agreements are junk and you can type these in and do like a policy search and you'll have all these district, districts and then like my superintendents you know in, a, in my fall class will be like well we have an abeyance agreement i'll say well here's the deal like tell me more about it and then the thing of like you're you're not one creating a behavioral record if a student threatened to beat up another or did beat up another student or staff member or threaten to do any of that. Um, so you don't have any, you don't have that record to possibly get intervention for the student. Um, if that student goes to another school building, they have no idea of the risk that that student has previously presented. Um, if you have multiple events that happen in the all of abeyance agreements, you have again, no longitudinal thing. Oh, this was the sixth time that this kid did this. Um, so, you know, these abeyance agreements are garbage and lawyers will back them up and they champion them, champion them. And they, they use positionality. When I was in rooms with lawyers as a school administrator, the lawyers would always press the parents to take the abeyance agreements. And the lawyers, it, these were short meetings. These were like 10 minutes long. You talk about no due process, right? The, uh, the lawyers would say, um, the district is, is helping you, is cutting you a deal, right? Because they're, they're, if you take this abeyance agreement, there's not going to be this record. Your kid's not going to have on his file that he was kicked out and stuff like this. We're giving you a, this big second chance, but you have to agree to it right now. And um, so there was all these tactics, the positionality of the school. And if you don't, like you're, you know, you're taking your risk with the board. And, you know, if your kid's going to go on to school or who's going to hire someone that, you know, got kicked out of school or, you know, all, all these other things are, what are you going to do with him? Because we won't have an obligation to educate him anymore or her. I mean, so they're going to be with you. And I just saw this stuff was now I look back on it and I have so little respect for the attorneys, mostly attorneys. Some of the attorneys I worked with are great. Some of them are horrible, but the attorneys who just simply knew that that was a tactic that they could use. And you didn't really know better because I mean, school board, and school board associations and the attorneys and all that were, you know, they, this was their thing. You know, they want to keep the, the attorneys are working for the school, right? And the school boards don't want to deal with these expulsions because they, they get to be very contentious and principals and, uh, you know, get burned out on these things. So um, it's a abeyance agreement. So then the parent leaves thinking they overpower the school um, or they believe thinking the school cut them a deal. So that's the way the abeyance agreements work. And so either way, the parent feels like they've received a deal or they've got the school to cave and give this abeyance agreement. Um, so it's really interesting when you read through that, that blog post I put together. And I should, I should come back with that and put that in a formal article through like Kappen or something because I've been working with a law school a law school contacted me uh, about seven, eight months ago, and I need to follow up with them and see where they're at. They were um, writing a legal note about abeyance agreements because they thought they were garbage. And um, and they were seeing a lot of these being kind of litigated, right, and things like that. But um, they asked my opinion because I put this stuff out there and I, we were going back. And so I got to see the legal note. So what a legal note is when it gets put out there is it's basically an opinion to inform the fact finder, the judge or a jury. It doesn't change the law, but it can be um, used to help make a decision in the future. So I need to check on where that's at actually. But um, I think that could have been at play here. Um, 
in what's happening in tech. I think I think it was a play at Parkland abeyance agreement. I don't know that for sure, but like abeyance types of, of agreements. Um, but they are they are all over the place, and they're they're a bad thing. So that's one of the things you got to weed out of all the school violence threat stuff is these abeyance agreements because your statistics when you I see these experts go on and and talk about well the statistics show that you know schools are safe and so like oh, that's right now you have to stop and say they show that because they are no longer authentically reporting or like North Carolina which I wrote in School of Errors had they increased their descriptions from a category of like a dozen things to like 113 literally one of them was a fray, which was like a fight between two people instead of like saying a fight. Hey, it's yo, 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 flying rich. Hey, buddy. So what they would do is they would just put it in more categories to make the numbers look lower, right? So if you have to sort things instead of 12 bins, you sort them into 113 bins. So um, yeah, I, I, I have, I'll go back and I'll, I'll write about those abeyance agreements and, and how you know these, these numbers and these suspension numbers also, I guess it's probably two separate articles maybe, but um, the suspension numbers are garbage. I know school violence numbers are complete uh, manufactured uh, garbage. And uh, I have the receipts on it, Thanks, thankfully. <laughs> like I did, I did a statistical analysis on these districts where they would drop maybe district-wide, again, from like 200 suspensions across the district um, in over like 10 years down to like five or eight or zero in some cases, they would report out zero. Um, and I would say the chance of that happening is like one in 750,000. Like I, I, met, I statistically worked it all out. And then I said, the fact that now you have an aggregate of like these 20 districts in a state that experienced a drop of 90% in one year, um, the chance of that happening, you know, like one in a million. Right. So there's something happening with the reporting. The reporting is different. And so, and, and you can see where these, no one will ever know on abeyance agreements. You could go as a lawyer and say for discovery in, you know, with a school and say, I want a copy of, um, the, I, I want, you don't say for confidentiality, the school won't release. Like you can say, I want the number of abeyance agreements that were issued by the school in the last two years, three years, whatever. And the school wouldn't give it to you because officially they don't exist, right? Even if the, all information was redacted and it was just a number of abeyance agreements, it doesn't exist. It, it doesn't exist. They don't, they don't keep this in a database. Well, they, they do, but right, they don't have to, there's no compelling thing because technically it doesn't exist. It's not a reportable thing. It's a ghost. So on a school side, that needs to be fixed. All school doors need to be locked. Um, and that's just take away a shooter, but that just needs to be a security measure. I mean, uh, it could be anybody who comes into a school uh, that shouldn't be there, non-custodial parent or, you know, drugs or whatever, things like, I mean, that just needs to happen. And then um, the something with a, a very defined kind of, as we, we said here with boat lift, like, right, what is your response? What what should this, the expectation be for a response um, when there is a, an active shooter in the building? Um, as far as when, when law enforcement arrives or if, if that's not going to be consistent, then what is, what does the school do, right? What is, are they? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think those are the, the, those are three things that would immediately improve, um, all of, all of what's happening right now with, uh, with what's happening specific to, to schools, school safety. One is we get rid of abeyance agreements because I think that abeyance agreements re, um, remove the, um, the, the behavioral records and the data trail. And also like a, um, it, it, and they, they separate students from services or from appropriate threat assessments. That's what abeyance agreements end up doing. 
so we get rid of those. We lock all doors during instructional times. And we, uh, what was my, oh, that we have um, that, all that statement from Admiral Loy, like, you know, do, do what you have to do, right? And that we have that understanding of what an, what an entry is going to, to be. Um, so, and then that has to be clear and a district then has to know. And if they don't, and if the, the law enforcement can't provide it to them, then they have to, as a school board, like we, we have a community close to us in, in their spring referendum. Um, so they're about the same size. I live in a community of 10,000 people. They're about the same size. And they, um, voted in the referendum to hire additional full-time firefighters and, um, uh, police. So like fire EMS. So there's like four total positions that would be funded by the city because they said, we're not getting state funding for this. The feds haven't been funding these services, but mostly like the state and where I live, the state really has not done a good governor's done a bad job of, of getting this funding down to local levels. I really got to see that when I was running for city council, but so they're saying, Hey, we're not getting this from the, the state. So we're going to increase everybody's taxes by whatever to have two fire full-time fire EMS and like two full-time police in addition to what we have. And they voted for it, like the community. Now the thing is like, so that's an additional cost in this community and will other communities do that? And what's the expectation? But I think you're going to have this with school boards where they're going to say, listen, if we can't, you know, if our law enforcement isn't going to provide this to us at a certain level of certainty, then we have to go through different means to get it done. And then that's where the legislative side needs to meet up on that um, of, of saying like, we've got your back. So, yeah. And I, I think it's, it's more, I, right. This is, this is school shootings, right. But we have thousands of thousands of kids uh, overdose on uh, fentanyl you know, high, like high school age kids across the nation, uh, whether it be in a school setting, it was probably less likely, but in other settings, but of high school age. So I think, you know, like this whole, this whole overall approach of, um, cause drugs are one of the biggest things on abeyance agreements. I talked about these, these, you know, kids with, with, uh, with drugs, these, these records typically don't get gen- generated that they had drugs, these abeyance agreements come into play. So, um, let's look, um, Sasa saying armed police station inside every school with rifles. Um, Sasa one too many, my old town, it costs around 2 million per year for the 10 police station at the schools. They were not resource officers. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those things. So when I wrote about, when I wrote in school of errors, I said school safety has become a $3 billion in industry, right? I wrote it, I, well, as I wrote about it in 2019. I'm like $3 billion, and the government just sent $40 billion to support Ukraine. And which seems like this recurring loan the way they got it structured. But I'm like, now the $3 billion school safety thing, you know, that which is largely sent on fortification, stuff like that. But uh, but I'm like, well. That doesn't make, that doesn't square, right? That doesn't have face validity that domestically, you know, we don't have an organized plan to, to spend more, right? <laughs> on school safety than 3 million, 3 billion, which is not federal dollars. That's mostly throughout the States. We have 40 billion going out. And again, it's not a, uh, Man, it is it is just crazy. Um, so that's where I look at that number. And when I was writing the book, I mean, it, and you'd see kind of these crazy things that the money would be spent on. Um, I I was, you know, it was pretty appalling. You know, like the the bollards and stuff like that. And and but but now, you know, I'm also like if I'm prioritizing things, I am prioritizing this 
student safety and community safety in America higher than I am for foreign countries, right? And that's not kind of where we're at. Um, sickening success. Andrew's saying, I get the feeling Dems don't want to protect schools because that would prove walls and fences work. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I, I many friends who were police officers in Los Angeles County, like Tom Marchetti, who I had on my show. Yeah, and, you know, and Tom said, you know, back in what was it, the 80s, and, you know, L.A. had in, was it Giuliani in New York? So the broken windows policy, right? I mean, if you had broken windows, I mean, you got them fixed to graffiti. You're, you know, you you were addressing things before they, and things did improve um, in New York and in L.A. in the 80s, right? And then... But, uh, but yeah, it's AstroTurf or Safe Kids, Sass is saying. Yeah, we had that in a school in my, my conference here where they received their pandemic funding of three or four million dollars, which you're supposed to spend, which was really ambiguous, right? You just do it to, the, I don't know get kids back into school or healthy activities or whatever. I'd have to go back and look at the, but you could make anything kind of fit this. And the school built a new football stadium with AstroTurf with the money. And they just said, well, kids can be out there and they can use the field. And it, you know, our, because of cold weather, our grass didn't stay. And, and the state's like, looks good to me. And, the, you know, the feds, as long as the money was spent, they didn't care. There was no audit of it. So, um, that happened. That actually, that happened. You know, just it made national headlines. But um, how can you ethically do that as a school board? And I, it is just a, it's amazing and appalling to me, right, that a school board would do that, because the money is supposed to go toward HVAC or hiring additional staff to try to make up some learning curve or whatever. And I understand like some of that doesn't make sense because perpetually you can't you can't hire staff out of fund grants because staff aren't going to want to do that. And then in two years, they lose their job because the funding's not there. Uh, but, you know, whether it be, you could have used the money to replace windows, to upgrade some HVAC things, to, um, I mean, there were things you could have done that likely needed to be done throughout your district um, for your facilities. Um, you could have upgraded to your technology system for kids, Um your the computers or your one-to-one -one devices with kids. I mean, but no, the the and they flat out said, um, we knew we wouldn't get the football field any other way. So this is what we did. So they didn't hide it. They said we met the legal definition and they did. There's no challenge. And the community kind of wanted it because everyone around there was getting artificial turf. So um yeah, real mess. Just a just a real mess. So, um, I think Sass mentioned something about our weather. So we we are on um, an upswing. So, it, like, it's hard to believe it's June in a week because we've only had like three, four days in the eighties so far this spring. And you know, once you get to June, you really have June, July, August. And then September starts to get kind of iffy around here. So you got, you got your three months. You got to be making hay. But uh, I am, um, yeah, I mean, so today here was like upper 60s and overcast. And then it kind of got rainy. Um, and the, now it's going to, we're going to get into the middle 80s. But um, but then I think it cools back down again into the into the 70s. So I guess we'll. We'll see here. Um, it was, I'll tell you though, it was so nice. So I have my dry cleaning, my Navy pea coat, US Navy issue pea coat in my 10 sport coats to the dry cleaner and uh, had to drive an hour again. And it was, it was dry cleaner, I think it was a funeral home at one point um, because you, you where you would come in in the front 
is is like a drive through area, like where it would have made sense that that's like where the hearse would have been. Um, but yet, like this building, they had been there like for 50 years. But as I was looking at this, as I went in, like I had, I had a really, I had to really pay attention to what I was doing because like I have a bigger car and like you wipe out your rims if you went up against these like curbs on each side in front of the building with the canopy over and the people were super nice they did an awesome job it's just like i kind of parked off to the side but there really wasn't a good place to do that and there were other cars but everything worked out um but anyway on the way there i took like the country roads and i used to know those a little bit better when i would go down in that area for meetings and i haven't been down there for quite a while so um but it was nice it was so nice yeah the window down I had some podcasts on, um, and some old episodes of TJ Martinell. Actually, in the Mountain Pass podcast, and there was one I was listening to, and he mentioned me. I was like, "Oh my god!" So, but uh, from like three years ago, it was funny because in 2019, he was doing this podcast again, and he said, "I think like next year's going to be really good, 2020." So, to play that one back, but uh, but yeah, I was. Oh, it was just a. It was a great day. I don't drive. A lot because I don't really need to. So I only have thirty thousand miles. My car's five years old, and uh, and so it needs to get. At, you know, I need to run through, you know, some gas and and get it out, and uh, and just for me, like you know, just to to kind of get back, you know, make sure stay in the routine of driving. But uh, it was just a, such a nice drive over and uh, and back. I had a good time. Good and yeah, I do that once once a year. I get my uh, all my dry cleanable stuff, and again, it went out of business here because they said the pandemic killed you know the business because people didn't have their formal clothes. And I live close to Madison, Wisconsin Metro, so like there were enough people, but again, you know they they couldn't keep. So kind of they it was family owned, and it and they owned the like three in my area, and then all three shut down. So they're I have you know I had to drive an hour. Just one, just one of those things. Like, I, you know, we don't have a glass place in town anymore either. So, like, if I had a window or screen, I didn't, I'd have to drive to get that fixed or whatever. But um, so that's the same. My AC is set at 79. It's running uh, all time. It's 90s every day. 90s. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right. I wouldn't like the 90s if it was humid every day. Um, although, man, I don't know. If I got to take that against 25 degrees and snow and like ice um, for four months, I'm, I'm probably taking the 90s and humid. Um, so just psychologically, like warm is just makes me happier. Um, and I have my folding, my, my camp chair, which I bought last year. Yeah, and I put it at, I put it on my driveway, and then I just hang out there a couple hours a day, like I did today. And when it's when it's hot, like I'll, it gets to be like six o'clock, and I'll pull my chair out. People are walking past, walking their dogs, and I'm out there in, enough now where I get to know people. And uh, so TJ is a thoughtful guy. So says, yeah, TJ, really, really good guy. Um, and he started to do his podcast again, so. Um, Sass uh, saying it's trade off, which poison I actually prefer hot. <laughs> so, uh, just been being cold the whole time. Um, I don't, I mean, psycho psychologically, honestly, cold weather is just impacts me more than hot weather. Um, so I, I, it just does. Um, you know, really, like it, uh, it's not that uncommon right i mean people in wisconsin who hit their 50s spend winter where it's warmer or they just move out of here so i um so sad to say hey, he left connecticut is 10 degrees and he got to florida february 11th put on shorts and I, i'm with you i mean i uh my neighbor across the road from us our neighbors always wintered in florida they had a house in florida and then as um so after they retired, they, he retired at 55. So for like 10, 10 years, 
And then they, they just said, and every year it'd be like later and later, they would come back to Wisconsin and they sold the house like three, four years ago. And they just told us there's no way like there's, it's just, we, we love it. And now we've act, you know, they've acclimated to the heat down there. And they just said, you know, even coming back to Wisconsin in May is no guarantee of warm, good weather. And then what do you do? You're, you, then really you're here for June, July, August, and you're leaving again. So, um, you know, you're spending nine months in Florida and three months here. It didn't make sense, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I know, I know people up in like Alberta, right. Canada. And I'm like, how in the world I have a, I know somebody up there who has a pool put in a pool on his house. I'm like, what you have like 70 days maybe to use that <laughs> outdoor pool. I mean, realistically, um, yeah, he just had snow this week like eight or 10 inches of snow. He's like, it'll melt. And I'm like, yeah, but come on. Uh, Florida summers are brutal. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm still going to, I'll take the trade. Now the snakes and alligators and things like that. I, I don't know. That would, that would be, I can, maybe need like a, a, like a middle ground on this. Um, old Umble, just what in tarnation is going on here? I'm, I'm testing out the, uh, the rebuild. So I don't have the second speak, the second um, camera up and I don't, I'm going to be switching this mic out, but this is just to, um, to kind of check, right. That my video software, I have the full new rebuild going here. So, which I'm the guy did a great job. I was, and I went in and I'm like, Hey Ryan, so what did I lose like in the upgrade? Cause I thought I'd have some programs that I would have lost. Although like I had the disc and stuff like that, but he's like, everything made it through. And, uh, and honestly, like I, everything, I still connected to my Wi-Fi. all my printer setter settings were still on. And I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, within like two hours, I had everything largely just reconfigured and, um, just, yeah. So I'm happy because, one of the things with not running windows 10, when I would do conferences or, you know, professional kind of meetings and stuff, I ran into some issues and it just needed to happen. I was running into to, um, errors with windows seven and it wouldn't shut down. And I didn't have, you know, I didn't have enough Ram, um, you know, so all of that happening. And as I said, the studio is going to be cleaned up a little bit in the back. The guitar in the back was my, uh, godfather's, uh, who passed away in, 2013 of cancer. So it's, uh, I'll always have that as part of my background. He's a great guy. I have my diplomas, which I pull out of a closet, but I'm going to actually have a, a nice frame I'm going to get for my PhD diploma, which I opened up tonight <laughs> after I got in 2016. I'm like, you know, I should display that. I guess I should put that. And then my professor of the year underneath the, uh, the blue moon, I'll probably move the blue moon. Um, and then I'm hoping I will receive my book will receive the SI Hayakawa award this fall, um, for the best semantics work. It's an international award, but I, I think, um, I've got a good shot at it. I've made it into a nomination. So there's a, a stratification process, right. To make it through nomination. And I've gone through that and it seems like there's a, there's very good vibes around, the book um, as b coming out as being judged the best semantic work of 2022. Um, meaning that the words bringing um, understanding to terms, wet ball, finite voltage, face validity, um, essential and things like that. It's kind of an obscure award, <laughs> um, but again, um, it's, it has been around about 20 years. Um, it is kind of like for the best there, SI Hayakawa award for the best semantics. Um, so he was a professor in 1935 here at UW Madison and then went on, uh, for the university of San Francisco, I believe in the sixties and seventies, um, died and he died in the nineties. Uh, but, um, I've, and he was, he was not, um, interred in, in the internment camps, the Japanese internment camps during World War II. He was allowed to stay in Chicago 
as a professor. So there's some just real interesting stuff. I've watched some of his lectures from the 70s. They're on YouTube. Um, they have been recorded. And uh, and also had a good sense. It was a good presenter. It had a good sense of humor, good sense of timing. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm hoping I receive that award. <laughs> And if I do, that plaque will go and everything's going to kind of be reconfigured into the professional background. The, the guitar is uh, staying, though. Um, Old Humble Singh, um, I have heard the rumors that you hippies are smoking the wacky tobacco. I know the rumors are about them. Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Not here. Not me. Um, so Sass is saying, I haven't seen a uh, snake or alligator. When we were down at Disney in 2017, like you couldn't go 10 feet without a sign of saying, stay away from if you see, see these and don't go down by the by the canals and stuff that they had there. So uh, those are all over the place. Um, so I'm turning into a pumpkin, work early. So all right, buddy. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. I want to have you on a show once soon, once I get everything set. And just um, so one of the things, Sass and I were talking about, and I want to do a show on, is um, per, your your personal possessions, right? Um, especially once you hit fifty, and kind of look north of that. How do you? How, I guess how do you consider your personal possessions? Um, my, for example, my wife and I recently have been talking to our kids who are middle school and high school. And we've said, you know, anything happens down the road to us or whatever, but there are certain pieces of furniture, right? Like that we had custom made and like this kitchen table, like make sure this stays in the family or these end tables are, you know, really well made. And this, this China hutch, we had custom built and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of like, they're like, well, maybe. Um, and, you know, we had a one bedroom set, you know, that we had um, custom built. It took eight months as, you know, as, um, we live close to an Amish community, like 20 miles away. And uh, it, it's interesting, you remember that conversation, yeah. And, and you know, so we've been kind of saying like, there's some things like we have here that, you know, you should try to con keep in the family. But at the same time, we have no idea, right, if they'll, do that or if they want that or um so like you know i have that with like my parents you know, they built a big house in 1992 and they filled it with things you know it is there's a lot of furniture there's a lot of things in this house um and you know it's, so it's me and my brothers so i mean at some point right like that will be something you know we will we'll have to to work through and what was important to them necessarily isn't important to us. And even like for what I have and what my daughter's like, I got rid of a lot of things down here and we have a, we have a huge um, garage sale coming up here next week that we're having. Our whole front room is full of stuff. And, and it's like, we're just getting rid of things. Um, and I am, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, like my 10 sport coats might seem like a lot, but, that is down from, I used to have twice that many. And these are like 10 and I mean, and I do wear them. I mean, I rotate them out because of the university teaching and stuff, you know, I want to have a variety of, of coats, but, uh, but I've had it no coat. My winter, my Navy pea coat is 30 years old. Um, and that will stay with me. Um, I just do not, you know, so that is something where I'm like, I kind of look, you know, this, like my tools um, that were my grandfather's yeah, you know, still hand tools and stuff like that, like planers. And I'm like grandkids maybe, but, or else if they, I, I don't know if my kids are, if they're married, the spouses, who's going to, or will they want this stuff? And so I think um, assessing it's our way of trying to take it with us. Hint, we can't take it. Yeah. So I think there's, um, I think that'll be a great discussion. We had a great discussion on it. So I would expect we'd have another uh, terrific discussion of just saying, um, yeah, what do you, what do you want us to one kind of surround yourself with? And the second is these, these weird expectations we have that things will 
be passed on and that they'll have the same value to other people. And it's it's really not fair to them, right, to, to do that. We need to kind of clean up our own things um, on that. And Sass is saying, I told Doc I sold, gave away, or threw away 99% of what I accumulated over the decades, yeah. And I mean, like, if I go and back me, I have a drawer full of music CDs from the 80s and 90s. And I haven't played a CD in 10 years. So, I mean, all of those should be gone. Um, now, like, my DVDs, I, I still play. So, I mean, there really isn't a thing there. But, um, but I mean, there, yeah, whether it be clothing, um, just, uh, I, there's so many, there, a lot of, I mean, there's things, books, there's computer cables, there's what, I mean, are the, what, but things that are, that are meaningful, I guess, to me, I have a couple chest, um, you know, wooden chests that were passed down, but I mean, like my, my bike, I always kind of think about that, you know, like my bike is a custom build bike and everything, and um, it will probably just be sold. Um, but it's like, Again, earlier in this podcast, um, I can, Sass, you might be the only person listening right now, but um, I, um, I, when I, when I bought these baseball or softball gloves, right, uh, from this, this guy on Craigslist, who is older than me, played in this 50 year old and older softball league. Um, I knew, like, I knew they'd be good gloves because he had, like, the pitchers and, um, also like the model number of the gloves and like a description of like how he cared for the gloves. And, but I met with, I met with this guy and we talked for like 30 minutes and he's just, you know, he said, I've got, I've got cancer and you know, um, I don't know how much time I've really got. Like, and so we've, we, you know, we've also downsized things and we had like a place, a uh, cabin that I built like with my dad years ago up North. And we thought that'd be forever. And it was staying in the family, but you know, the kids have moved out different, places and actually somewhere in different countries and they're not around to do this and I'm not able to go up and take care of it. So we sold it and he's like, you know, how, and you know, and now he said, I just, I don't, I don't need these things and I don't want these things. You know, we're trying to downsize into, I, I think they, they, they sold their house and went into, um, he and his wife into like a condo or something. So yeah, but I mean, it was like this whole meaning of kind of like what Seth and I talked about. And I also um, was, you know, something, you know, I picked up three nice leather gloves for $60 total. And, you know, so I'll, I'll use them for catch with my you know, daughter and she can have one that she gets, if she continues with it, if not, you know, younger, if we have any grandkids or whatever, we can do that. If not, I mean, it's not that hard to get rid of a baseball glove. You donate to Goodwill. But it's this thing to the guy said, I'm glad these are going to you. And I, I'm glad we got to talk a little bit. And I know that you and your daughter are, are going to, you know, practice and, and, uh, and kind of, so it was this, this meaningful thing for him to do that. But I'm kind of like, that could be me. Like that could be any of us. Um, so yeah, I, I am going through and, you know, that's one thing with, with kind of the way the economy is right now, right? And all this, this weird, sketchy inflation and stuff like that is like, there are a, l- a number of things I don't really want and need. And I, I have no desire to spend money. And one is like on a fancy vacation, right? On, or, you know, going out to eat and, you know, um, I, I just don't have, so, you know, well, I guess we'll leave it at that. Sass, thanks for staying here till the end, buddy. I, and let's plan, you know, sometime in June, if it works, you know, works out for you, whatever day would be best. And, and let's do a show. Um, I'm, I'm getting the studio. It's kind of, I mean, it's exciting now because with the machine rebuilt, um, and I'm, it's just so nice to have a stable platform and it was getting real iffy <laughs> Not, like in the last um, couple months to the machine would never shut down. I go to shut down. It would just freeze. So I'm traveling due to see my girls. Well, awesome. Awesome. Sass. Whatever, whatever works for you, man. So yeah, if it's July, if it's August, so um, that is, that'll be cool. 
And I know what you can listen to when you're traveling, when you're doing your drive. I know what you can listen to. So audiobook. But all right, Sast. And if anyone is is watching, it says there's one, which I guess is Sass. So thank you, buddy. Uh, I'm going to sign out. And I, this has been a successful test here of the system. Again, I'm going to be changing out the mic and some things. Uh, but uh, yay, velocity of information. Yeah, um, definitely. It is in three um, university libraries in Germany. It's weird because like, as I bring it up, it's overseas, man, is the book is just like hot. And, uh, I, and I, it's, it's interesting. That's why I think it has a really good shot, really good shot at the SI Hayakawa prize, which also is a thousand dollars award with it. But, uh, so audio and video have been spun on good. Um, so I don't know, maybe I got, maybe I need to give the mic a second chance. Maybe it was the uh, windows seven that was messing things up. Um, on this. So uh, we'll see. All right. Well, Sast, um, take care, buddy. And uh, always, you know, appreciate your feedback. And uh, this has been a, this has been a good one. So peace. All right. Take care, buddy.